Space, the final frontier. This is a review show for Star Trek The Next Generation. It's continuing mission to explore interesting plot points, to seek out goofs and continuity errors, to boldly go where no other TNG review show has gone before. It's Wednesday, it's 8 o'clock, it's the TNG Review Show! <laughs> good evening everyone, <laughs> good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and it is us, we are back, um, discussing another star episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, with myself, Montaban, and my co-hosts, Mazzy McBob. Good evening, Maz. Howdy ho! Howdy ho! Tarvikins Turner. Good evening, Tarvikins. And the Mandalorian. This is the way. <laughs> it is the way. It is the way. Um, welcome back, Sean. I, I, it's good to see you at the beginning of a TNG review show. Well, kind of to see you. Uh, yeah, I have a break this week. Uh, I'm back for another six weeks, including the show. So don't wonderful. get used to it, but uh, I have a mild reprieve. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'm all a little bit lost because it's um, things have not been going right for me backstage this evening. Um, I completely uh, realised uh, just coming up to go live that I'd accidentally deleted the uh, intro and all the source files for the intro. So I had to recreate it in about 10 minutes flat from scratch, which was uh, not fun. But hopefully you didn't really notice any difference. <laughs> and we're here. We're here to consign to our vault another episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, good evening, everyone in live chat, including Ty Time Lord. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, the Derp Trek Master is in the house. And good evening to uh, Ruth and Stuplum. Good evening to you all. Um, so, how are we this week? Mazma Bob and Moopsie, uh, how are you doing? We're good. We are back from our travels. I did not take Moopsie with me, though, unfortunately. But... Um... Yes, I had a good time in Norway. 
seeing a certain Tabby Tabby Kins Turner and um, meeting her little kitty wings. And, and I was I was thinking about something you were saying, Tabby, about how it's not natural to walk up to people and touch their hair. But that's literally what I did to your hubby. I walked up to, to him and the first thing I did was tug on his whiskers because I said I was going to be able to do that in person. <laughs> it was prepared and it was, it was prepared and approved. I, however, I don't think you would have done that to a man you didn't know. <laughs> no, that's very true. It felt like a safe space. <laughs> but uh, yes, no, we had a great time. We went to lots of museums and uh, walked around Vigaland Park and clambered around on the Opera House and saw art galleries and went on a boat. And yeah, it was, it was a brilliant time. Had a great time. It's lovely to meet you in person. Hopefully we'll do it again soon. <laughs> I was starstruck through most of it. I had to continue staring at her inappropriately, just hurt at Chris at the same time. Like, she was really like, it's going to sink in in about a week's time. <laughs> <laughs> I was the photos and I was like, that happened. It really did. They were here. I was worried the entire time that they're going to be like, you're staring now. It's getting a bit much. But they were very kind. Uh, <laughs> I should uh, send the picture of us. With, with, we found a Vulcan sign, and we were all like, <laughs> taking pictures like this next to the Vulcan sign. Ah. Um, Sean is is Holly. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, doing a good impression. It's pretty good. He's either Holly or the is it the the the, the Queed? <laughs> Queeg. Uh, Queeg. I don't think I could pull off Queeg. No. Uh, no, that would be uh, offensive. <laughs> well, no, that's true. Um, no, what was, what was the other one uh, that he was uh, playing chess with? <laughs> I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah, that's Queek. Yeah, what? there was yeah. Oh, there's, oh, there there's was another Cassandra one. and there's um, there's uh, Hilly, of course. There was another one. There was there oh, was another one yeah. which he he, he um, played chess with over long uh, like as a pen pal. And, oh, uh, uh, yeah, I, I forget that one. Yeah, good shout. He was like, uh, who's winning? <laughs> and he's like, well, I guess I am, really. It was the first move. <laughs> uh, anyway. Tubby, how's your week? It has been good. Um, well, there's a story from Maz's visit that has now developed into another ridiculous conundrum. We went to a, this uh, taco place in one of the food halls. And as you know, I grow stuff. And they had this corn on display. And it was red, yellow, and blue corn. Oh, and yeah. I wanted to know if I could get some of that corn to see if I could get it to grow on my farm. Um, and Naughty Maz, I don't know if we, we should, Naughty Maz was ensuring that I at least got the blue corn. <laughs> <laughs> While I was talking bowls to on the, the counter, yeah. you can't just put it in bowls on the counter and not expect people to put their hands in it. <laughs> <laughs> so while they were chatting me up, and I and I'm like, oh well, I, you know, I'm you know doing a farm, and I'd love your corn uh, kernels to try. And they're like, oh sure, Maz is in the background, <laughs> being the a swiper. Um, well, it was they gave you what yellow and red and i yeah. finished some yellow and blue so you've got all three now swiping, Luckily, if no she swiping. Had, if she hadn't nicked uh, yeah that's oh you got the you got the reference i got the reference <laughs> i have had kids <laughs> if it wasn't from as i don't think they would have given me the blue no so mm. they only had one on display it was a. Uh, it's um uh, and there were a few pieces, but yeah. So I brought them home. I was suspicious about the quality because you don't know if it's been irradiated, um, which will kill the, the the seed on the inside. Mm. That's how they sanitize all this for these foreign foods. And I was like, ah, a lot of the stuff I tried to grow from seed that I've gotten from the stores that I'm interested in died. Um, we got two little containers of red and yellow, and her ten piece, her eleven pieces of blue. And I'm like, there's no way all of these are going to germinate. So I'm just going to soak half of them using one technique and another. Every single one. They're all growing. 
has uh, has uh, uh, sprouted. So they were That's very, very darn viable. quick, right? That's a couple of days. Yeah, That's crazy. After after two days, they usually take four to, to seven wow. to germinate. Yeah. Um, well, they Yay. germinate. My I now have several trays of of corn all over my house. I too much. I'm, we filled up the guest bedroom because it's over 150. Um, Yay. Yay ish. It's going to be 150 like plants in my house yeah. because it's snow. There's snow covering everything. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to be living in the cornfield. They me. always said you were addicted to really corn. Is. At least I assumed that it was corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they were saying. <laughs> like, like, like corn addiction. Yeah. Uh, Sean, how's your week? How's things uh, in the even, theater? Uh, I, all right, I have a week off from rehearsals, but uh, they've decided we have to be off book next week, so I'm spending like an hour or two every day reading a script over and over again, blocking out the lines with a ruler, trying to see can I remember the next line repeating and repeating and repeating so it's very tedious yeah i mean i i wrote my you know the, the things we'll go through for the episode today i wrote it down over the last couple of days but i have to do that because there's no chance of me remembering any of it from one day to the next so like the whole idea of remembering lines now would just terrify me i have to say well, it's 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 a muscle, and it, it's not one I normally stretch. So it's uh, yeah, it's a bit tough. But anyway, mm. I'm kind of getting there. Um, depending cool. on the scene, I'm better on some than others. But anyway, it's just I agreed to do it, and just have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations, uh, and good evening to uh, Mr. Tavikins. The beard is in live chat as well. Good afternoon to you, sir. Um, he's already put his answers in. He's gone for a DBBCA uh, combination. So uh, we'll see how well we'll see how well the beard goes. Um, yeah, yeah. Get my um, score sheet up. Get your score sheet up. I've got the picture ready. I've even got the picture ready, and I've got my wheel out. So I might have been behind on oh, some man. aspects of this evening, but on others, I'm I'm all there. I'm all there. Kicking booty. Kicking the I, bottom. May I, ooh, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> may I announce the winner for last week's dad joke? You didn't get to do it in oh. the point. <laughs> I, this week, just marinating in the, the corny funness that I, for some reason, makes me way too happy. And the winner is with the dad joke that lasts for ages was Stu Plum's joke. The the dentist joke. Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> that what, one. What, and, that? And what really what really set it off is that he's told you this joke before. Oh, uh, was it two thirty? <laughs> was it that one? Yeah, it was mm. oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. <laughs> oh. It was too good. Yeah. It was so corny and even better when Mazza was like, What? What oh, he's done this before. <laughs> Uh, it was yeah, such a nasty masterpiece. Well, that is in, you, Stu Plum's a dead. That is true dad energy. There, you can tell he has got. He's a, he's a veteran, he's got, you know. So uh, he's got XP. <laughs> yeah, Tavi, a, a man um, goes to his doctor and he needs to get hand surgery, and the doctor goes, "Do you have any questions?" And he goes, uh, "Yeah, will I be able to play the piano after this?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, definitely. There shouldn't be any problem." He goes, "Strange, I wasn't able to before." <laughs> A I actually messed done. up. My, I actually messed up my hand before. I needed stitches right on the. Oh, you probably can't see that. On the knuckle came off a bike, and I meant to use that joke, and I completely forgot it, and I was so annoyed with myself because I had a perfect opportunity to say it to an actual doctor, and I didn't get to do it. What did Picard call it when he studied herbology? His specialty. His specialty is. Mm -hmm. yes. No. <laughs> right. You gotta, you, gotta let, you gotta let Sean read them. Did you hear the award? Did you hear the award Picard got for uh, running his vineyard? 
He got it for being outstanding in his field. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Okay, so the episode we are consigning to our vault this evening is Homeward, and it is episode 13 of season 7, which means this is exactly the halfway point towards the end of the last season. So this is half the season down after this evening. It is production number 40277-265, and it first aired in the US on the 17th of January, 1994. It's the 164th episode to be both produced and released. The teleplay was by Naran Shankar, um, who we've talked about a number of times recently. And this was his eighth of nine episodes, just one more for Naran. The original story was by Spike Steingla- Steinga- Steingazer. Steingazer, I think. Spike Steingazer, what a name. That's a pretty cool name. This is his only uh, writing credit for TNG though he did write a Deep Space Nine episode as well, uh, When It Rains. Which is oh, funny. no, St- Steingasser. Steingasser. Yeah. Gasser. Ga- yeah, but well, I, I but if he's American, he might very, he might say Steingazer, Steingasser, but if he's American, but Stein, it'll be Steingasser. Stein, Steingasser. Um, yeah, he wrote another Deep Space Nine episode, When It Rains, from season seven. Uh, it's the one where Odo gets ill. You know, they find he's, like, dying. Um, It was directed by Alexander Singer, and this is his last uh, directing credit for TNG of six. So this is six of six, and he uh, directed episodes like Relics, Descent, and Gambit. Yeah. So that is the uh, production. Anything else on that, Maz, that I may have missed? No, just that it's the last episode of a series to be directed by Alexander Singer. Not that we've—I don't think we've really mentioned him before, though, have we? Yeah, I just said that. I just said that. It's his six oh, and six. You? Yeah, he did Relics and Descent I'm Part One, Two. Trying to do two, two other things. I'm and trying Gambit. To do two other things. And, yeah, we've talked about Alexander Singer. He was actually a massive Star Trek fan. Uh, and, a, and a sci-fi fan when he was given the opportunity to a uh, sort of last minute to direct relics because um for us, um because it was supposed to be Brandon Bragger but he didn't know anything about T- TOS so um they brought Alexander Singer in as a as a sort of safe hands for relics and it was kind of like his you know first coming in directing Star Trek that he was a massive fan of and uh, directing um, Jimmy Doohan, uh, Scotty, yeah. you know, it was kind of like a dream come true for him. So, Well, by the time 567 came around, um, they were a bit looser about it. But for the first couple of seasons, if you were a fan of Star Trek at all, you kept it to yourself because the production people, for whatever reason, didn't want people that were fans of the show making it. Mm. Nowadays it's completely different, but they just they wanted to distance themselves from TOS and they wanted to start again. Oh. And uh, so, is it, is it the uh, Whitley uh, Neil first? Is it? <laughs> Very good. Um, so the teaser. And we what have, are you drinking, Montban? I don't have one. It's, it's still in the fridge. Oh. I didn't uh, because of all the chaos leading up to it. I didn't. Uh, I didn't grab it. Uh, yeah. I'm completely in a pervy mood tonight. Um, so you go ahead and put the oh my button on. Um, because this is the third comment that I'm like, "Mm?" (laughs) because he's like, like, I didn't pull it out tonight. I'm like, oh, the night is young, Monty. Don't get smiling rainbow soaps, (laughs) dash. And uh, of course, Sean was like, you know, it's not a muscle. I'm usually stretching. And I'm like, oh, is it not? Um, No, I, I... The reason why I say that is uh, just there's a lot of like all the TV actors and these things. Sometimes they got six new pages the morning at two hours before they're going to shoot it, and they're getting their makeup done and trying to learn it at the same time. 
like professional mm. actors have to do that you know like they don't get uh, 10 weeks to rehearse a play to get it down it's like no no you, sometimes you get an hour mm. uh, or the script comes on a but Sunday night just thinking of what positions you stretch your muscles in and yeah, but I don't think the script comes on Sunday night and they do it Monday morning and it's like bang <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's just yeah, what I mean by that is, yeah, it's it's a skill. And if, if you practice it, it'll you'll be better at it, like any skill. Better at uh, stretching it. And... Just stretching keep it working yeah. at it. It's, it's good that you. Anyway, yes. I've the sent teaser. you a couple of pictures on WhatsApp, Monty Ban. I don't know if that's the right place to do it or not. You don't have to share them, but they're there. In case you I can send them uh, on something else if that's better. What have I done? Hang on. It's just one of the Vulcan sign, me and Tavikins, together oh. in the flesh. And the other one is a picture that I saw at the um, at the Edward Munch uh, gallery, who, who looks like a character on Star Trek to me. And um, I thought you could guess which character it is. Macaulay Culkin. Darn it. Hang on. Do they not want me to get into Macaulay this? Macaulay Culkin? No. That's what she said. Oh, hey, guys. there we are. <laughs> Stood outside Vulcan. Yeah. Found Vulcan in Norway. What was Vulcan? Very cool. Was it a restaurant? Or a... It's, it's a, like it's an area, that, right? It's a shopping it's area. It's that area, that mm, art right. gallery. And, and That's pretty cool. Me. And then and this... guess the character in this Edward Munch. Oh, yeah. uh, looks a little bit Rene. Yeah. yeah, it's Odo. Doesn't it? Yeah. It's a bit, it's it's a bit like Odo ish. <laughs> he is a bit Odo ish. Yeah. As, as, um, as I said, if, if, you, go to, bar, a suit. It's a if you go to Switzerland, um, I, th I think it's Zurich, but um, his, I may have mentioned this before, but uh, there's a Rene Abergeon Wa place uh, dead center, like when you come out of the train station, because his, uh, his grandfather was a famous painter. With the same name. Ah, I don't know if you have mentioned that before. You have. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> I just have a bad memory. Right, stop that. There you go. And back to that. There we go. Okay. So the teaser. Here we go. The episode opens with a captain's log telling us that the Enterprise has arrived at Boral 2 in response to an emergency distress call from Lieutenant Wars foster brother, Nikolai Rosenko. He has been stationed on the planet as a cultural observer. A bit like the Who Watches the Watchers uh, people. That never goes right, does it? They should stop. They should just stop that practice, like and use some satellites <laughs> or something. Just, just don't do that. One hundred percent failure rate. Yeah, because it's insurrection. We get another one, don't we? We have data as a cultural mm. observer, and uh, just, just don't do it. Is the is the is the key? <laughs> oh, there's there's another episode um, with where he um, he brings radioactive stuff into the village and it's made of jewelry. They make it into jewellery and they all get mm, sick. That's right. Um, yeah. I forget the name of that one. But yeah, it's happened too many times. Yeah. So data reports that Baral 2 is experiencing atmospheric dissipation, which will render it uninhabitable in less than 38 hours. Well, that's, uh, that's climate change gone mad, isn't it? Mm. It's all a conspiracy. Yep. Worf looks pretty worried about all this because obviously his brother's down there. <laughs> then the ship gets rocked by plasmonic energy bursts generated by the at atmospheric dispersion. While it doesn't pose a threat to the ship, data will monitor the situation. We got uh, Riker there doing his uh, uh, Riker stance. Riker lean. Yeah. And data talking to his crotch. As is as is the way, as is what is standard on this ship. <laughs> Into I'll, the mic. I'll I'll tell you a quick one. Doug Drexler showed a video of um him showing the bridge to some of the design guys from TNG, the remake bridge, and bringing them on it. And uh, Dave Blass was there. And anyway, anyway, um, 
uh, Jonathan comes in and he starts talking to him and he immediately just plants his arse on a console and starts chatting. <laughs> And some people in the comments are like, how disrespectful they just built that. And I said, I said, I, I would consider that the highest compliment that like he almost forgot that it wasn't the same one. He just sat down on the, on the, on the buttons like he always did. Yeah. It's his way, isn't it? He's just, mm. yeah. So uh, Rolf reports that Nikolai has left his observation station, but there are faint energy signatures coming from the caverns below the surface. He asks Picard's permission to beam down, and Picard agrees, but Worf has to be surgically altered to pass for Beralion, or Beralon. Sorry. So he heads off down to sickbay, where the doc asks him about his brother. It turns out that Nikolai is the older brother, and they are not at all alike. His brother attended Starfleet Academy, but left after a year, as he couldn't follow rules. But he does have many fine qualities and is a natural leader. Worf beams down to the planet and goes on hunt for uh, goes on the hunt for his brother with the aid of a tricorder. Don't let him see that, because that'll confuse the bejesus out of him. He gets instantly found. He literally doesn't take one step forward, but gets instantly found by uh, one of the Barat Baralum. Um and Wolf claims to be a traveller. Then his brother and Cassidy Yates comes forward and warmly greet him. And that is the end of the teaser. That's the uh, that's them hugging the brothers, the Rashenko brothers. Okay, so the first question. Um, whoop, how long did... Whoop. Oh, how sorry. long did that? Uh, Sorry, hang on. It's question time! Sorry, I, I, I forgot that. I forgot myself for a moment. How long did Data... Uh, how many... How, how long did hours Data say the planet have? Because I meant to write it that way. A36, B38, C40, or D47. And uh, proofread people. And uh, bonus, Penny Johnson, who later plays Cassidy 8 in DS9, also played Dr. Claire Finn in what show? Arrange these uh, words into a, a sentence that makes a question. <laughs> <laughs> How long did hours data say the planet have? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, it should say how many hours did data say the planet has, but or mm. I don't know why I rewrote it and I anyway forget I did that. Yeah. So, I will say in advance that I don't really have any goofs for this episode at all, but there are a few little bits of triv here and there. Um, probably the most interesting of all the trivs for me um, is the first one that I'm going to say, which is that the star date for this episode was 4743, uh, sorry, 4743. And the star date for the last episode was 47457. So, star date wise, this episode occurred previous to the Pegasus. Okay. It just seems a bit odd. <laughs> I don't know if they've ever done that before, but I don't I can't remember that having occurred before. It it happened in Voyager because um that when when did, uh, Balana and uh, Tom get engaged they get engaged and the next episode he proposes and then the episode after they're engaged again. There's something like that that happens late in the season where they, they oh. mix up a few episodes. Um, it's something like that. I forget now, but it's something like that. Oh. I've got to go yeah, my wine. I don't know why. Yay! I also have but, some wine. I have some rosé called Trimboli Pink Duck Montepulciano. Yeah. It, 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 it does sometimes happen. They they have to pull an episode early because they're due to produce one episode next week and then an actor isn't available or something and they just have to skip it and do the one after and go back and do the first one again. It happens. Yeah, it might be related to something that I'm going to save for later, so I don't do all my trip no. from. But um, something did happen with the filming. Um, I also had a note. What's Cassidy doing there? Um, as you noted, noted, um, you know, Penny Johnson goes on to play a main character in Deep Space Nine in, in the later series of Cassidy Yates. Um, also, the only other two comments I've got is about um, 
the guy who plays Worf's brother. There he is on the screen. Mm. Uh, he's called Paul Sorbino. And apparently he requested to be on the series. He really wanted to be on it. And at the time when he requested, they were just discussing the role of Nikolai and they were going to cast it. So the producers immediately thought he'd be really good, um, you know, to play that character. But as soon as I saw him, I was thinking, gosh, he looks like the same age as Worf's parents. And um, in fact, he's only six years younger than Georgia Brown, who plays uh, Worf's mother and 15 years younger than Theodore Bickel, Bickel uh, who plays his father. So, um, yeah, the kind of casting of ages there isn't yeah, quite he, right. But... This is about four years after Goodfellas. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, he's completely the wrong age. And not Russian, he's Italian. And he also can't act. <laughs> oh, be nice. You just got back. You've only been acting for, he, for a little he's, over a he's, month he's now. Good. He's good at playing Italian mobsters. That's it. That's his area. He should stick to it. Oh. Additionally, uh, sadly, the actress who played um, uh, their mother died a year before this episode. I mean, she's mentioned in this episode, um, but she sadly had passed away by this point. Yeah. So. Indeed. Mm. A bit like an Italian chef. Leave it on a bummer. Away. That's all I've got. <laughs> I wonder if the the stop in the episode there was a slight um intensity in the uh in in the brothers uh conversation and when i was watching it i always thought like damn they're really acting that part really well i wonder if it was actually because they're refer they're thinking about the actual actress mm. that has gone because she's could mentioned have or could have been the, the, at least the character she's playing is mentioned but I don't, for some reason, I just saw a glimpse of like some deeper emotion that that was a bit more. So I, mm. I didn't know that she passed away. I'll have to watch it again and see if I see that. Sean, you got answers to the questions there, mate. Uh, yeah, the first one was thirty-eight hours B, and uh, it was the Orville, of course. Are you covered in bees? Oh, and they've got eight bees we've got a's and b's so and b's. some people got it right some people not so much a's and b's and one d from beard and one d from <laughs> so the not, oh, yes. not quite right this <laughs> time beard <laughs> I, I, th um, I think I think I may have bamboozled them with my Google Google Translate level of grammar in that question. <laughs> <laughs> How long did hours data say the planet have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it was too much gin? It, it's got the perfect bite, and there's there's enough. I put a lemon in there, half a lemon, and a oh, mezzarone. It's good. It tastes good. You were just like pouring for about ten seconds, and I was like, "How much gin is she putting?" And let's see. I was pouring it very slowly to make it look like it was a lot, but I was pouring just really slowly, drizzling it in. Um, These gins were courtesy of uh, your Star Trek family, brought brought, brought them over, duty-free. Because uh, alcohol is just so bloody expensive in Norway, I thought it was the least I could do. <laughs> this is utterly delicious. You have no idea, like, I'm tasting this and it feels orgasmic, like I shouldn't be on TV doing this right now. But, oh. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't know what's yeah. going on with my gasm. spin wheel. Oh. Yeah, that's, oh. that's better. That's better. Okay, so who who do we got on the wheel then? Uh, uh, for the Orville, time, we've got Time Lord, we've got me, we've got Ruth, we've got Tavi, we've got Monty Van. It's just Stu did not answer the bonus. Tavi, so Monty, Time Lord, Ruth, Maz. Oh, I think that's right. I'll put I'll put Sean on there as the wild card. You you're our points losing. Uh, person tonight then Sean as we don't have You're a our black hole <laughs> there's no Wookiee black hole today there's a Sean black hole All right. our Wookiee's gone AWOL right I'm spinning wheel and <gasps> it's and oh. it's Sean oh, oh no wait that's the wrong music Perfect. Wow. Oh, Stu Plum is ahead. Stu Plum, you've, well, you've lucked out on that one. I mean, he was already ahead on the count of, um, you know, getting the 50 bonus points. So now he's really ahead. 
Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if that counts as, as bingo trivia to stun. That was painful, Sean, right out the gate. <laughs> <laughs> he, he giveth and he taketh away. <laughs> yes. I should, I should warn you. The questions in this episode are the the content in this episode is quite thin, so some of my questions are really out there. Oh no! Oh, my Here we go. Oh dear. Okay then. So no. Act One. Bad. The the Boralan Varin in particular is keen to know how he got to the caves with the storms and all going on outside. But Wolf insists on talking to his brother alone. They just kind of ignore his questions. It turns out that Nikolai couldn't sit in his outpost and watch them all die. He had to do something. So he told them he was from another village and led them to the caves. Wolf tells him that he only postponed their deaths. He hasn't saved anything. Nikolai wants to discuss it with the captain, so Wolf agrees to return him with him to the Enterprise. Well, they tell the village... Speaking, Sorry, go on, John. Aren't you... Aren't we... You don't really save a life, you just postpone death every time, isn't it? Well, yes. It's the, it's the one constant of the universe, isn't it? Mm-mm. That and yeah, taxes. Yeah, death and taxes. Hey, mm. where's my dum dum? dum There we go. Um... So they tell the village um, they're going to go back to the surface to pick up some provisions. Uh, They're naturally concerned about this, but Nikolai tells them that Worf is a seer and can see when it is safe to travel. So nobody needs needs to worry. Good evening, Smiler Rainbow. She finished work very late this evening, very late. Varum wants to go with them, but they turn him down. Aww. Paul in. I recognised him, so I had to look him up on IMDb. And I know him from Continuum. He was in Continuum. The S9 one, right? Uh, no, the series Continuum. Oh, right, okay. Uh, it's about a time travelling cop lady from the future. Mm. Yeah, and it was in the Great River on DS9, all right. Yes, the Great River, yes. And he's also in... Lions um, and Geigers and Bears. Oh my. Mm. Yep, he had a role in Voyager. Lieutenant Durst. Yes, he was like a Vidian as well, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Tabikins is singing in uh, (laughs) in live chat. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Back on the D. We're back inside the Big D. In the Observation Lounge, Nikolai outlines his plan where they create an atmospheric shield to come, be camouflaged so they won't un- see it. Um, camouflaged like the Watcher's Outpost. Um, but the shield will at least save the one village. Uh, but Picard's like, fuck off, you're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, was a bit of a it's a bit of a letdown for the poor chap. <laughs> Nikolai makes his argument that the prime directive was put in place to protect a culture and protect them is what he's trying to do. So, you know, he's kind of like thinking that his idea is all pro um you know, prime directive. But Troy's like, not really, love, is it? Not really. It says we can't interfere with them, so we should just let them die horribly. And that's uh, that's Troy's take on the situation. <laughs> with that facial expression, just <laughs> let them die. Just <laughs> let them die, yeah. Everybody yes. was so cold in this one. Yeah. We read the manual. And this is not one of our decisions to break the prime directive. So yeah, we do it all the time, but because this wasn't our idea, fuck no. We didn't initiate So the dro- the do- the doctor here tries to support uh, Roshenko, um, but stating that they are interfering, uh, they uh, they are interfering anyway, as they could choose to save them. Um, so them, in fact, doing nothing is also, in a way, interference. I don't quite get her logic with that one, but uh, no. she's but on her own. Cheekbones. Perfect cheekbones. Oh, oh they were they were yeah. happy on the cheekbones today. That was they my script. All their- 
I yeah. accidentally put a link to my script rather than to uh, the next picture. But anyway, I'll go back to Picard. Where is he? It was a picture of Picard, so I'll just... Uh, oh, that'll do. There you go. But Picard won't be for turning. Uh, the Prime Directive only allows them to save species that have evolved space travel and can theoretically save themselves. Everyone else must just stand... We must stand by and just watch them die. Is basically uh, Picard's take on it. Resistance is futile. Oh, sorry. I was, <laughs> all those memories were coming back from there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they will be vanquished before me. But um, Nikolai asks to return to the observation post to retrieve his logs and research. But Picard says no. Though he can retrieve it from the comm link uh, from the Enterprise. Wolf apologizes and offers to help him with the comm link, but Nikolai turns him down. On the bridge, Data estimates that the atmosphere will be gone in three minutes. Crikey. Nikolai enters the bridge and asks if he can enter his log into the library computer, which Picard agrees. So he goes to one of the science stations and... In watching the planet die, Data finds that the data from the surface is still being interrupted, so he has to apply additional filtering. Picard gives a little speech about how, in these cases, where they can't do anything about it at all, nothing within their power, all they can do is honour those who can't be possibly saved. And, yeah. But Nikolai tells him there's nothing honourable about this and he takes his leave isn't that dramatic and cold-blooded as hell let's all stand here and be sad for the people who are currently going to die right before us don't push any buttons don't help anyone just let's be sad together because they were so oh. stupid not to have developed space travel and been able to save themselves too late you're with the dinosaurs stupid humanoids <laughs> dumb I get, can you imagine if that if the, uh, the 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 species that seeded the galaxy with all of us were like you you didn't help your peeps you didn't help your cousin over there no. really we thought we'd find we, each other and get along we did protect their culture except for it doesn't exist anymore because they're all dead <laughs> yeah anyway uh so uh, yes Nikolai's gone he's left the bridge Picard also thinks the mood on the bridge is a bit depressing so he buggers off as well and leaves the bridge to Riker Riker's like oh, thanks for that he orders a course to Starbase 87 at warp 5 and he's about to settle in his command chair when a sparks come from the science bay behind him it turns out there's a drain to the EPS distribution net, which Worf locates to Deck 10. Riker sends Worf and a security team to go check it out. Worf sends his team out to search Deck 10 whilst he searches the holodecks. He enters the holodeck and finds Nikolai, who shows him a cave where the villagers are going about their villagery lives. He did what the Enterprise refused to do. And that is the end of Act 1. Oh my god, I've done it again. What's that, no, Brittany? I keep putting the wrong links in. But anyway, there he is, entering the uh, holodeck, and that is the end of Act 1, and it's time for another question! <coughs> question time! Which of these episodes do we not see a member of War Family that's not C? Um, a Family... B, Star Trek 6, C, Reunion, or D, Brothers? And the bonus question, what equivalent to a prime directive covers time travel? The time travel version of the prime directive, what's it called? With this and this it's mentioned in voyager relativity it's mentioned in picard season three it's mentioned in discovery season four or season three 
everyone's favourite season of everyone's favourite show, Discovery. Hmm. Wouldn't oh, have seen it. Did Did you see the? Uh, sorry, for, I was just going to say um, small bit of news. Um, uh, the Prodigy was released in France the other day, so if you want to watch it in French, it's out there. Um, I, I can't imagine that that would make it any worse, but <laughs> oh, Prodigy is brilliant. Oh, Prodigy, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking Discovery for a minute. Oh, yeah, Discovery, but uh, no, well, it's actually, it's, I'm I'm re I'm rewatching Discovery. It's not awful. It just <laughs> if, if you binge it, it's much better. Sorry, go on anyway. It's not, it is awful. I did like seasons it's one and two, but after awful. Season two, I didn't know they were going to make another season after two. I was like, oh man, if they stop it here, it'll be just good. Just leave it right here. It's well, amazing. Well, it's exciting. And then I'm like, wait, what? What, 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 what are they doing? What? Well, the, the original idea was it was going to be um, an anthology series. So each season would be a different story from a different place in Trek Universe. And the first season was going to be the the federation romulan war and then the next season they'd move on to something else like a completely different like the enterprise b year or something and then they just keep changing it year on year but they just somehow that got thrown out and they ended up in the tos era forever sorry but i just realized my answer says temperature Prime Directive. No, I meant temporal. It's all to correct yeah, it's temperature. <laughs> it's te I, I probably would have accepted tem that. Temporal Directive or Temporal Prime Directive. But, uh. Sorry, Maz, we shut up now. We, you, we have trips or something, I take it. Uh, not very much, no, but um, only a little bit. Uh, so this is the first time in the series that Michael Dorn appears without putting on makeup. However, it's not until Deep Space Nine's Far Behind the Stars where he get, has no prosthetics at all in his role as Willie Hawkins. Um, and I quite like the fact that he's not got his makeup on when he's dressed up as an alien, but it's annoying that they have that thing covering the rest of his head. I'd have liked to have just seen a bit more of him, really. Um, but then again, I always want to see a bit more of what. Um, mm -hmm. And what I found, I mean, it's later on, but like towards the end when, when they're sort of saying goodbye, it's just nice to see him sort of using his eyebrows more and having a more... Um, emotive uh, yeah. face because it's obviously more mobile so um, yeah that's kind of really nice um, I've, I've, I've seen a lot yeah. of people who have a thing for Worf and because of all the makeup I never got into it but this episode I'm like oh <laughs> <laughs> it was I didn't see now it. you see oh. yeah yeah <laughs> in, even in the and that makes him look nicer in this well, Woo! they took away the Fu Manchu mustache. He's got a standard, a standard like goatee, goatee yeah. rather than the Looks Fu really Manchu good on him. one. You know, oh. I think it's called well, a Fu Manchu. It, yeah. I think yeah. Well, I think they needed it in the early series to establish they were the same Klingons they saw in TOS mm. to kind of have that continuity. But the, you know, the Klingons with their foreheads have established themselves by now, so they don't need it anymore. I noticed that's now, one gonna... of the things that made. Worf look odd in Picard season three. Like he looked fantastic, but the one of the things that made him look slightly strange was he had a standard goatee rather than a rather than the Fu Manchu mustache goatee. Uh, Terry, Terry Metalis blocked me on Twitter. The the produced the showrunner of of uh, Picard, and he's 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 famously block happy on Twitter. But I went through my tweets anytime I contacted him, and I hadn't contacted him often. And I was like, the only thing I said that he could have blocked me for, I said, wow, there was a first photo of Michael Dorn in his makeup. And I said, oh, thank God, the Klingons look like Klingons. And uh, yeah, he blocked me for that. <laughs> so he didn't like me shitting on Discovery for uh, having the wrong Klingons. I, I, was, I was just going to say as well, uh, Colomini has a um, convention story. There's an episode, I think it's called Sons of the Empire or something like that. But anyway, Colomini and... Avery Brooks have to put on Klingon makeup and Colum right, and they had these fingers and, and yeah, they had them all as Klingons and uh, to, when they find out Martox are changing mm. and they, uh, and anyway, Colum was like, I can't move my eyebrows. I can't move my hands. They've got these weird fingernails and things. And he was complaining and bitching and stuff. And Michael Dorn just turned around to him and told him to shut up because he'd been doing it for 10 years at that stage. And the two Ma of them are Mas like, knows what's that, what that's like. Hey, Miss. 
<laughs> not been able to move my big, oh oh not been able to yeah I've had both up so I can't move my um, eyebrows in the right way but um, yeah go on thrown not us. quite scowl, as bad as scowl <laughs> good effort <laughs> I'm trying perfect effort I, I raised my eyebrows though just but I just can't oh. proud <laughs> brilliant well, right, Sean, we've got answers to the uh, questions now. Um, uh, I have yeah. one more thing. Sorry. Oh, well, sorry. Oh, go for it. Just that the idea of uh, using a holodeck to transplant an alien race without their knowledge is also used in Star Trek Insurrection. I know you mentioned Insurrection earlier. Oh, very good, yes. Um, when Sona mm. um, works with the Federation to remove the Baku from their homeworld, although in this case it's motivated by their desire to render the planet uninhabitable. Um, but as it happens, uh, during the early development of the film, Michael Killer and Rick Berman referred to that element of the pro plot point as the Sorvino switch after Paul Sorvino. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, they were sort of harking back to this episode and using that similar idea. I'm done now. Yeah. It's quite amazing that uh, they actually were all asleep, you know? But yeah. they're, they know? <laughs> they're staying in a cave and they didn't decide like you know maybe have a couple Somebody's of people on guard out. duty or, or something like that because there may be like animals taking refuge in, in, in the cave mm. or you know no the whole village was asleep every single one of them so. well you could you could say that you put them under stun but then that raises a whole other load of plot points when they don't do that later um but, so the, the questions anyway the first question is D brothers um, yeah he's not in that one A family his parents the Rajenkos are in it Star Trek 6 uh, um, the the elder Worf um, Chancellor what, what is his name Ambassador Worf no I forget what it, what his title is but there's a different Worf in that also played by Michael Dorn reunion is his brother Kern played by Tony Todd and as I said brothers is is uh, unrelated uh, although there's, there's two so, there's two Brents in that one uh, sorry, the bonus question, um, equivalent to, yeah, as I said, temporal, temporal prime directive. Yes. So who is for the wheel? We have... Uh, Tavikins. Well, she put temporal accords. Is that okay? Um, yeah, that's fine, do, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Mazza, uh, Ruth, uh, and Monty Bam. Stu did not know. Stu did not know. That's fine, Stu. You're, you're already way ahead of everybody. Some people are currently on negative Lord. points and you've got like 70. So, right, so um, no Stu Plum. So, so Stu Plum's the only one not there again. Um, yeah, and uh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Time Lord did answer, so yeah, he's on there as well. Just Duplum. Here we go then. Yeah. You could you could get lucky again. Do 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 Time Lord. It's it is Time Lord. Well done, sir. Give yourself some extra TNG points. Congratulations. Chris joins us in the chat. Um he didn't get a notification. Sorry, Chris. Our channel is quite small, so sometimes it just doesn't. Uh, it just it, it just doesn't notify people because they think we're too annoying. small to be important. How annoying! So, I, get, um, I yeah. get notifications. You're sure you've got you it switched do. on? Yes. No, I do. But set e even even set an alarm on your clock. Eight o'clock every Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. It, e even if I go to my homepage, it doesn't only show me that it's live at the front. Um, oh, no, it doesn't. Like I'm I'm looking at my homepage now, and it's showing me Trek Yards is live, but it's not actually showing me. That, uh, yeah. that which, is, like. which is it not just, important, Sean. Which is not no. important. Anyway, Act Two. Oh my God! What is going Electric on with my Boogaloo. pictures? What is going on with my pictures today? This is supposed to be Wolf and Nikolai walking down the corridor. Actually, you can just about make them out in the black panel there. You can just see a reflection of them about to come around the corner. But anyway, later in the corridor. Nice. <laughs> Nikolai's explaining how uh, he used plas the plasmonic burst to overload the sensors and secretly beam them all into the holodeck. That's the other thing is like in no time at all he managed to recreate like stone for stone like the cave that they're in in the holodeck and then beamed them the whole village into the holodeck without you know 
the computer or anyone All without, a bit implausible, isn't it? without transport chiefs <laughs> realizing in uh you know the enterprise hmm. just had suddenly a whole population of people on board and didn't go to the captain um you know we've got another like 25 people in the holodeck is by the way, I think that that ship would have safeguards. Like it would not allow for additional things to just populate itself mm. on the ship. Like there would be a sudden warning. Our our crew complement has increased from one thousand and eleven to one thousand forty five. You, you would think that, that there would just be a ping, BTW. But no. Yeah. So yes, there were no records of the beaming. All the. Uh, Borallans were asleep, luckily, and the holodeck's rock is uh, rock for rock, as the cave, it all matched, and it's all worked perfectly, and they are now living their life in the holodeck. In the turbo lift, uh, Worf's brother asks him uh, to trust him. It's all going to work out. Um, he was not going to stand by as Picard spouts Federation dogma, but, Picard, uh, but Worf is furious because he's disgraced himself and Worf. He will have nothing more to do with him. Picard is also furious and demands to know what is expected to do now. Nikolai has a plan. It's a good plan. He plans to find an M-class planet and make it their new home. Is it a very cunning plan? It's a cunning plan. It's a plan so cunning, it graduated, graduated in a Master of Cunningly from Cunning University in Cunninghamshire. Um, so yes, he plans to take them on a journey in the holodeck and gradually program the holodeck to change its environment until it matches the planet that they're going to, thus completely fooling the Borallans. Picard's not happy about any of this, but he feels at this point he has no other choice but to go along with the plan. So Picard, LaForge, Crusher and Data meet in stellar cartography to find a new home for the Borallans. Geordie finds out that the holodeck is malfunctioning. Its image processors have been severely destabilised by the atmospheric dissipation. It's not a question of how the holodeck will cease to function, but when. Roshenko prepares to re-enter the holodeck and start the villagers on their journey, but Picard doesn't want him acting on his own, so orders Worf to accompany him. Worf isn't keen to be near his brother, so suggests maybe Troy would be better qualified to go in his place, but Picard doesn't want to confuse the Borallans further by introducing someone new into the mix, so Worf reluctantly agrees to go. And that is the end of Act Two, and it's another question time. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the first question: Which of the following are not a founding member of the Federation? A thrills, B Vulcan, C that should say Andorians, or C or sorry, that should be D Tellarites at C again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I may I may not have proofread this, uh, and. Uh, the bonus question, um, what fate befell Lieutenant Durst in Voyager? Uh, Maza may have mentioned earlier that Lieutenant Dur Durst was played by your man Vorvik in The Caves. As I said, he also played Geiger in Deep Space Nine. So a certain species got to him. It was the episode with the two Balanas, I'll tell you that much. That should make it quite easy. Okay. Uh, the Jekyll and Hyde Balanas. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, as we've already covered a little bit, uh, you know, silly about how the whole village was transported and, you know, why didn't they just put them all to sleep even once they knew they were there? You know, they could reinitialize the holodeck or even just put them in stasis until they got to the new planet. Anyway, who knows? Um, so in the non-canon Star Trek Next Generation Starfleet Academy novels of Peter David, Worf's foster brother was named Simon. Oh. A little known fact. Mm. Not very interesting fact, probably. I doubt you've actually read those non-canon novels, but there you go. 
Um, several of the Borallan background performers appeared elsewhere in, uh, elsewhere in Star Trek, uh, actors like Pam Blackwell, Uriah Carr, etc. Quite a few of them. Uh, and that's about it. There was a piece of trivia about Marina Sirtis changing her hair color in this episode, but that's not true. It's been like that for several episodes now. Yeah. Yeah, and Marina had a wig. It's not like she went to the hairdressers and got it done a different way. You know, for consistency, all the women wore wigs, and a lot of the men. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, okay. and the men used to have to get a haircut every single week, and you know, they they just to make sure that the hair was always the same length. Yeah. Uh, a and killed by Seska. That's a good guess. I had no idea. I knew it was A. Uh, Chris doesn't seem to have any idea. Stuplum has no idea. Well, I said it was the one with the two Balanas. I thought that would have given it away. One Balana split in two? Nobody remember that? No. There's a human Balana and a Klingon Balana. Because her, um, her Klingon DNA is particularly resistant to the phage. Uh, did he get killed by a feral Klingon Balana? No, oh. um, so so the the, the Avidian doc scientists wants to have by Balana because of her, her blood is resistant to phage, splits her into a Klingon and a human, and starts doing experiments on the Klingon, and the the Vidian is really attracted to Balana and Balana, the Klingon Balana and Balana plays along with it to get his trust, and in order to make him more attractive to Balana, he kills Lieutenant Lieutenant Durst. And then grafts his face onto himself, so he looked more human, so she'd be more attracted to him. It was really creepy. And, uh, I thought that would stick in people's minds, but you clearly horrible. do not remember this that's episode. An awful story. That's. Uh... Yeah. Uh, but but the actor Vorvik who plays this, he had to play both Lieutenant Durst and the Vidian because obviously mm. the Vidian has the face. That is face. So he did the full Vidian makeup, and then they took it off, so you could see his face through it. So it was it was really good. Hmm. Mm. And not only that, um, uh, uh, Belana Torres, uh, oh, what's she called, the actress, can't remember what's on there. She, Roxanne Biggs Dawson. Oh, yeah, she she does really well in that episode, I think, having the full Klingon version of herself and the human version of herself, because they're both really different to her normal hybrid version. Like, the way she acts it is really good, I think. I don't remember and, that. And the, big, and the Biggs and Roxanne Biggs Dawson really? from K Casey Biggs, who plays Damar. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth was thinking like me, killed by a Klingon Balana. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that's a good guess. Um, that's I, I'd give it to you for that because the the Vidian scientist who was wearing his face is killed by the Klingon Balana, so that's not wrong. It's close enough. I'd accept that. <laughs> um, so you do. I'm really glad about that because it would have just been me on the board, right? <laughs> mm. I, I guessed it too. Oh, did you? Good. Sorry, I haven't actually read all the answers yet. It puts and the dude who wore his face like a Halloween mask, hoped you could bone Balana with it on. Yeah, you'd, you'd clearly remember that one. It was creepy those, as all hell. Oh, <laughs> those organ creepy. harvesting alien lepers. <laughs> it's just, I'm surprised I didn't get more answers. It's just something that really sticks with you. It was so creepy. It was brilliant. Yeah, yeah just really don't, don't remember that at all. You that whole episode you blanked it. I don't know how. It's yeah, I don't know. Really good one. Uh, it's because next year I'm fifty, so my brain now is basically <laughs> yeah, starting to melt. So I want to say right. the episode's called Cathexis, but I'm not sure. I'm you're, looking you're forward to, to like going through Voyager because it's going to be like watching it for the first time. It's going to be great. <laughs> Remind me, what, you, did, where's it, when's your birthday again? October. October. Oh yeah, yeah. I was thinking it was near mine because I'll mm. be forty in October, so next year. Yeah. Oh yeah, March 15 next year, not this year. Not you're this year. Yeah. Yourself. yeah, I I was born in 85, so yeah, so I guess you're 75 then. 75, that's right. So yeah, um, uh, so yeah Monty and Time Lord can come off. I can come off. So that's it then. Almost <laughs> all the ladies except for the black hole. Uh, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. <laughs> I love you, Sean. Oh. <laughs> ready? Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Are you ready, kids? 
I can't hear you. Oh, never mind. I was spinning the wheel. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> I, I, I was in a burrito place once and like the staff were messing doing that behind the, the counter so I started doing it with them and anyway the, the guy they laughed so much they gave me a half price burrito <laughs> while I was in while I was in while I was in the in the queue I started messing with them <laughs> playing along <laughs> it was you it was you you got the points what a mess nice. right, who lives in Chris a pineapple under the sea Chris is complimenting my beard, so I'm just going to give it a little... There we go. <laughs> An old floof. A little floof. Give it a floof. Do you know, do you know those things you put on, on women's heads? You know, the big, the big space balls helmets. Can you get one of those for your beard? Like, fluff it up? I, I, I have no idea. I, I'm going with no. It's not the same type of hair, you see. Do you know hair mm. follicles on your head are round? Where the hair follicles in facial hair are like hexagonal. They're like flat sided. Anyway. <laughs> Fascinating, Monty. Thanks for that piece of information. It's helped everybody today. We're on Act Three. So Nikolai and Wolf return to the holodeck. <laughs> and they return to, with, to the villagers with food because they said they would be. Nikolai Jesus, tells him he's got big ears. Sorry. Yeah, he it's uh, yeah, he has the lobes. It's a bit of a giveaway of age, that isn't it? When you <laughs> yeah, your it's a big one. Drinking. Your ears and your nose. Yeah. When they start flapping against your neck, you know that you've uh, reached a certain age. <laughs> With women, it's when something starts flapping against your knees. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, we have oh, that problem too. Please tell me you're talking about tits. <laughs> oh dear. That way. It's when you start tucking them into your waistline, you know, you got you got problems. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> Nikolai tells him uh, there is nothing left on the surface for them to return to, but there is a place far from here where there are no storms. Wolf says he will lead the way. It will be a very difficult journey. Uh, the plants will be different, and the stars will be different, and the grass may be purple, and the gravity may be slightly different, and the animals will be different. <laughs> And the sea may be orange. <laughs> Apart from that, you'll recognise it. You'll recognise it. There, uh, and there may be pineapples in the sea. There may be. There may be. Do, you just do, never know. Do, do. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's kind of got to sell the whole different sort of thing there. Uh, okay. But, well, uh, um, sorry. Can you just do me a favour? Because apparently this gin is doing something frisky to me. Usually I'm all over data, but can we go back for a second and appreciate that war photo? Uh, Damn, he's fine. There you go. Do you see what I mean by the change of mustache? Giving him, giving him, giving him a standard mustache just completely changes his look, doesn't it? Woo! He's looking right. Hmm. I can see. I can see why his baby mama was just trying to get on that, and she was like, "Thank you. I just need to get some of that by." Oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> but yes. woo, looking like that. Anyway, Thorin here is not buying what Wolf's selling. Questioning, but but why why would the stars be different? I don't get it. Luckily, the awkward questions are interrupted by screams. It looks like the holodeck is falling apart. Wolf thinks on his feet and tells the people, "It's a sign. It's." It's the sign of the forge. It's a good omen. <laughs> it means the road ahead. I think you would know better than to do that. What with, you know, the Picard that was worshipped yeah. by the, um, oh, I can't remember the name in the watches. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he's so, going to yes. go down in their full history now. Uh, the the La Forge is uh, you know uh, uh, a sign of God, I guess. So yeah. Um, I'm going to tell a ra slightly rambling side story for a second. I was watching a podcast with a guy called Mark, Mark Bernardin, uh, who who uh, who was an intern on G Space Nine and wrote on Picard, and he's a writer in general. But um, anyway, he, he he met Lavar Burton one time, 
and he introduced him and he said, look, I just want to say thank you. You're the reason, as a black man, I got into writing because you showed me it was possible and stuff. And they walked off. And anyway, he went to the lift and uh, and the lift was closing and he put his hand in and then LeVar Burton had actually followed him onto the lift and he goes, you didn't think you were going to get away from Kunta Kinte, did you? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Oh, it was funnier when he told it, apparently. Sorry, moving on. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Um, <laughs> There's yeah. your rambling. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Sean rambling. I don't know if that's a uh, thing on there. Oh, it is. I believe it is. Uh, yeah. it is. is there a moopsie on it? There should be. Um, there isn't. Moopsie was post when the bingo was last Yeah. Week, yeah, next time we need a, we need a moopsie. Ah, the sign of La Forge, a good omen. That's where we were. It means the road ahead will be filled with good fortune. Uh, luckily, as he's saying all this, Geordie is uh, listening in and fixes the problem, and the villagers seem to believe that the omen was true. Wolf's brother is like, well, well done, Wolf. We make a good team, but Wolf doesn't believe they are a team. Nikolai tells him, that he isn't here to fix their childhood problems. He's just here trying to save those he cares about. Meanwhile, in stellar cartography, Data and Beverly are looking for new planets. It's between Drago 4 and Vaca 6. Drago is the better planet, but it's only three light years from Cardassia space, which is not ideal. Vaca is a more hostile planet, but it's in a safer location. So they decide, after much going backwards and forwards, that they'll go with Vaca. Vaca 6. Back in the holodeck, Vorin tells Worf about their chronicles. He's the writer of the history for the tribe, and he's surprised that Worf doesn't know what they are. Worf honestly tells Vorin that his people tell stories and sing songs, which is indeed what the Klingons do though Vorin thinks that's silly because the stories will change from person to person. He has maintained this chronicle, or... (laughs) Sorry, was that? I said, which indeed they do. Which indeed they do. They like to get more grand uh, with each generation, don't they? Or with each each telling. Um, Their chronicle's been maintained for 17 generations, though he could only save the last six. He shows Wolf the latest panel, which shows the destruction of the village and Wolf and Nikolai leading their people to the promised land. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have this. In, sorry, I was going to say, I don't know if you have this in Tribs and Goofs, but I mean, that's a lot of panels for one event. I know it's a fairly biblical large event, but I mean, he doesn't have that many panels. <laughs> if he's devoting that much to one event, how much are they possibly documenting? I know, you think he'd be carrying around like a big cart with like, you know, mm. stacked high with these panels, like but, uh, maybe, they're I mean, only that's, highlighting, that's... maybe they're only highlighting major events that happen to them, and then for the rest of it, they're like, no, it was just regular spring, it was just a regular summer just a regular, and only when oh, we had that hailstorm and it killed like five people, let's put that in there Yeah, I mean, so, if each of those pictographs represents a word, I mean, that's, you know about a page of text that's <laughs> not that much well, I hope not I hope it's like like Japanese I, I've been learning Japanese lately people and um, if there are any Japanese viewers out there that can help me I would appreciate <laughs> help but um, those symbols can be they, they, they're like one word but they could mean like a, a plethora of things just put together with like two words and you've seen like the spoof on Kung Fu movies. I think it was Kung Pao or something where he's going on and on and on and on. And then it's just two words it, when it's translated. Or he'll yeah, say. That's Wayne's world. But... Or he'll say two words in, in that foreign language. And then it's like this paragraph. It's a long translation. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. mm. what, that's what I was like. Oh, yes, probably that. Yeah. Chris pointed out that maybe the um, the hieroglyphs here, the pictograms, uh, mean more than like you know, they they tell a story each. You know, might mean more than just a word. 
you know, th there's nothing worse when uh, even if you you, you kind of know two languages, if someone asks you to translate a word from one to the other and you can't think of it, <laughs> mm. you're like, I know what it means, but I don't know how to say it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I also pointed out that when he saw this picture, all Chris could think about was, I protest, I am not a merry man. A merry man. <laughs> does look a bit like that outfit. Yeah. Uh, I don't have my audio clips anymore. But I mean, here he gets shown these chronicles uh, with him and uh, Mikhail taking them to pull up the promised land. And in Wolf's head, he must be thinking, oh my God, I'm now Moses. Because he's basically <laughs> going to be, this is going to be like their Bible one day. So he's going to be like, well, it's a good job. And then, and then when it comes to your verse, it'll be, and then there was Worf. And then there was Worf. <laughs> yes. So uh, they go on their journey, but Vorin realizes that he has lost one of the Chronicle Scrolls and he has to go find it. Eventually, Worf agrees. An elder needs help packing, and Worf agrees to help him, but actually it's just a pretext to introduce Worf to his daughter, as he wants them to marry, in case something should happen to him on the journey. But Worf tells him that he's sure everything's going to be fine. Vorin finds his weird. scroll in the cave, and unfortunately, after finding his scroll, he also finds his way out of the holodeck. Dun, 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 dun. And that is the end of Act 3. It's question time. Okay. Ryan at 3. Uh, how did Worf explain the glitching pool of water? A. Sign of the Forge. B. Sign of Picard. C. Sign of Sung. D, I saw the sign. I opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. <laughs> I saw the sign. I opened up my eyes and saw the sign. Who <laughs> sung it? Uh, was it? Was it? Um, was it those people? Um, oh, those God. Swedish reggae artists. Uh, something of something. Ace of Base. No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. Yeah, it was Ace of Base. Yeah, oh, was it Ace of Base? Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was Ace of Base. Yeah, and Drago 4 is unsuitable. I just realized Drago 4 is probably a reference to Rocky, and I never noticed it until just now. And I wish I had, because I would have made the question about it. It's unsuitable because it's too close to what space, or whose space? Because Ivan Drago was in Rocky IV. He was the bag, the Russian guy. Yes. So it was Drago Four must be a reference to that. And I only just noticed it. If he dies, he dies. Yeah. <laughs> I shall crush him. <laughs> I love it. Right, I was just trying to catch up on bingo, but I'm back in the room. Act three, right? Um, yeah. Oh. Oh, wow. sorry. It was, Dra it was Drago Four. There was a Y in there. Never mind. Oh, uh, why? I put it down as Drago as well, actually, on my notes. Um, uh, so Drago. all I've got, yeah, which isn't much, is um, they re they go to Vaca Six uh, at maximum what, right? Do they break the speed days. limit? Are they going to have the Federation? I was wondering. Speed police after them. Because in just the episode before, he was told he was allowed to break the warp limits, but in this one, that was a special assignment, that. though, wasn't it? He's gonna have to. He's gonna have to do one of those like speed awareness courses, naughty naughty boys club course, isn't he? Where they sit you down and remind you the stopping distances, and and you know. it can't be that they've you know changed the engines or upgraded them or anything because, as we said earlier, with the um, star days this occurred before the last episode so um if it was still in place it in, in in the last episode then it would still be in place now so yeah and um, the only other stuff i had was about that guy being in other you know other episodes uh which we've already covered so that's all i had for this act i'm oh, the, afraid the, the environmental limits on um on warp engines is never repealed 
Uh, all that happens is as technology advances past the point where they're doing damage anymore. It's like, yeah. you know, they, they, they banned leaded fuel, uh, just, but then the car, because cars were knocking, the, the engines and cars were knocking, so they had leaded, leaded fuel, and then they banned the leaded fuel, but they just made better engines. It's just, just you know. That's the head cannon assumption, though, isn't it? As it's never yeah. mentioned. Well, yeah, and again, apparently part of the reason, well, the only reason why Voyagers and Nacelles bend is because of that, uh, to account for that, that somehow bending, having them rotate. But no other starships gets rid of the do effect. that. But uh, yeah, and then the explanation is, is later on they realize that's kind of redundant. They just figured out a way to do it without the bed in the cells. Or, like Defiant, you don't even need warps, uh, nacelles. You can just have it all internal. And don't worry yeah, about it. Yeah, well, it's a small ship, so line of sight doesn't really matter. They kind of overlap. It's fine. <laughs> it's bigger than the NX01. Mm. But anyway. I suppose internal volume, I suppose it is, yeah. An XL1 covers a bigger space, but yeah. But not as ma mass. But the inter internal space, not so much, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just hearing a dirty conversation right now. My goodness. Can't continue. Anyway. <laughs> Talking about um, this. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not so big. It's all internal. It just, it just fills up the space. It's the girth. Like, geez, it's right? the girth of it. It's the, uh, yeah. Any, uh, oh, yeah. On the, Tabby, uh, oh. Sorry, go on. Sorry, Tommy. A woman walks into a bar and sees a hot bartender and says, any chance you can give me a double entendre? So he gave her one. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay, answers there to was questions. Another and... joke in, there's been a couple of jokes in chat. I haven't been noting them down, so I hope you've been um, looking at them, Tommy. I've got a list so far. Ah, uh, Good. I hope I got all of them. I mean, copy pasting them so I can ruminate <laughs> on them. For Chris, we might have missed it. Um, any kind of dad jokes, corny dad jokes, put them in chat. You might get an extra 50 points at Tabby's discretion. <laughs> Especially if it tickles me. <laughs> yeah. Tickles you where? <laughs> <laughs> Um, answer the question. You guys sure. give me something dirty in this in this gin. So I'm all <laughs> it's a frisky dirty gin. now. It, it uh, yeah, it, it, it's I on. I, it's I definitely didn't lace it with the uh, you know I didn't. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's from Pot Cosby's private collection. Oh um, my goodness! <laughs> oh, that's a bad joke. Oh, 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 oh my! So it was a oh, it was a Cardassian. See Sean's face. That's a bad show. <laughs> bad, bad show. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewatch this part of the video. Okay, who's on Everybody. the, um, who's on the thing then? We've got, I think me. Me. Mass there. Roof's there. Stay from. Is Chris she there? Says, Some territory disputes. Chris answered A, but didn't answer the bonus. Didn't answer the bonus. Hmm. You didn't answer the bonus. No, you didn't answer the bonus, Chris. You never know. We might all oh, lose points here. Why are pirates called pirates? Because they are. We yeah. had that one last we week, actually, one. Chris. Sorry. Did we? We did have that one last <laughs> yeah. week. Yeah. Right. I'm just going to be sure, I think. Is that everything? No, no, I, I, I gave the second pirate joke because what's pirate's favourite letter? Oh. 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 It was nearly a good result for Chris there for, for a moment. Oh, my goodness. It was nearly. Tabby, did I ever tell you about the magic tractor? No. It turned into a field. <laughs> it turned into a field. Oh, dearie, dearie me. <laughs> dearie me. At the moment, um, 
leaders on the board are myself and Stuplum. I don't know how I caught up with him with his early lead. Uh, impressive. Tabby is nipping at our heels. Heel. So that's the top three at the moment. When's a door not a door? When is a jar? It's, uh... <laughs> oh, is that one yours? Oh, it's I just, just read the one Sean put in chat. Terrible. I haven't heard that one before. I didn't see it. When's a door not a door? No, my, my that doctor, one's not in my, chat. My doctor told me I need to stop masturbating. When I asked why, he said, it's because I'm trying to examine you. Uh, God. Oh, dear. That's Gross. awful. Okay, act four. We're on to act four. We knew you there. Not that far to go. Two acts to go. So, yes, Vorin is making his way through deck 10 and finds his way to 10 forward. And he's a little bit shocked about what he sees. He can't quite comprehend it all. Deanna, as it's her sort of skill set, introduces herself as a friend of Nikolai and Wolf and tells him everything will be all right. But the poor guy is absolutely terrified, clutching his scrolls. Unfortunately, due to his neurophysiology, the doc can't wipe his memory. So she has given him some drugs and he seems a lot calmer now. Picard tells Vorin exactly what's going on and he seems to understand that his home is now gone forever. Picard points out that they can make a new life on a new planet but Vorian doesn't see how their culture will grow when everything it was based on is now gone. It's kind of a good point. They just have to grow in different um, ways. I mean, from a, well, from I mean, a point of view of his culture's point of does view. Does the people mm. make the culture or is it the place that makes mm, the culture? Yeah. I, think it's the I would think the people. The but they're, they're a simple people, aren't they? So I can, I can understand his point of view. Yeah. You know. um, are, are you familiar with the the monkey and the ladder uh, experiment? So, basically, what you do is you get a room and you put like ten monkeys in it, and you put a ladder with fruit on the top. But anytime any of the monkeys go up to the ladder, they all get drenched with ice cold water, and then one by one they replace one monkey at a time from the room. So, and every time a new monkey comes in, they and they try to climb, then the other monkeys pull them down. And then eventually all the monkeys have been replaced and none of them have been, been uh, drowned with water once. Uh, and they're all brand new monkeys. But every time any one of them times to, tries to climb the ladder, the others will pull them down. But none of them understands why. That's culture for you. Mm. It's just a lot of learned behaviours and traditions. Not all of them particularly make sense. No. No. I mean, we're doing this. Why? I, I don't quite know. But here we are. Here we are doing it every yeah, Wednesday. Well, to be fair, that didn't really exist five years ago. Well, yeah. it kind of did, but certainly, but it was niche. Not, not in this way, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, how do you get 1,000 1, Pikachus on a bus, you Pokemon? Uh, I need it. There you go. <laughs> how do you wake up? How do you wake up Lady Gaga in the morning? Pa 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 poker face. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. I pushed my Steam Deck go to help button. Welcome to Stream Deck. <laughs> yeah, I pushed, the wrong, I pushed the wrong button. It meant to be the da dum button, but oh, I pushed the wrong button. Okay, so, uh, yes. Uh, back on the... Ho oh, no, what have I done? Oh, gosh. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Is there a oh, reason yeah. why Diana is back in her little cat suit as opposed to being in uniform? Yeah. I think it's because they were in Ten Forward. She tends to wear it more as like a casual wear. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Hmm. So, uh, back on the holodeck, the, the Boralans are continuing their journey. Wolf takes Nikolai to one side and tells him about Vorin. Nikolai is worried that Vorin's going to return to the group and he's going to tell everyone what he saw. And Wolf's like, well, yes, you should have thought about that when you started this whole thing. I don't quite know how Nikolai was supposed to, you know, 
come up with every eventuality. But uh, yeah, there's there's a, there's a, there's a certain point where that argument doesn't work anymore. And they start arguing about their childhood issues again. Nikolai was always the one getting into trouble, and Worf was always the one being the perfect, dutiful son, etc., etc. Yeah, just don't him, ever watch the DS9 episode, Let He Use Without Sin. Hmm. Why is that? Sorry. Because it completely contradicts that. Oh, yes. He, he, he was he was boisterous as a child and he went up to head a ball in soccer and he ended up breaking the kid's neck by collapsing his yes. head. And it's only after that he became disciplined. Too disciplined. Mm. Yeah. So, complete bit of contradiction in canon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wolf tells him that it's better to be devoted to duty than to make our mother weep. And he won't discuss it with his brother any further. And they continue their journey. That was the bit that I thought that that acting seemed a bit emotional. Hmm. When he brought up that. And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Anyway, continue. Nobody wants to make their mummy cry, do they? Take yeah. your hood off, boy. Take your hood off. <laughs> Are you my mummy? Face. Are you my mummy? <laughs> that, that wasn't a reference to anything, Tavi. It's fine. It was. I think we've had uh, ding 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 yeah. ding ding One, one foot in the grave. He was in it. Hey! That was it. Hey! I'm t- dude, believe I'm, it! I'm tipsy, so you guys gotta go easy on me. This gym has uh, got me all yeah. marinated. Doctor Who. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a Doctor yeah. Who reference, anyway. It was a Doctor well, it's Who. It's not reference. even Ghost Candle Week. Yeah. Later that evening, they make up camp, and Wolf checks in with Geordie, telling him that the malfunctions in the holodeck are increasing. Geordie tell <sighs> Geordie tells him that they are they just need to hold on for another eight hours, and they'll be there. Cassidy, Cassidy, Ye- I mean, Deborah, I mean, Dobera, wants to speak to Wolf, and she asks him to forgive Nikolai. She tells him that he is a brave and com- compassionate man, and she loves him very much. She wants them to be a family. He's like, but what do you mean? Well, it turns out she is with child. Wolf's like, fuck. How's Beverly yeah. going to get the prosthetics on that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's the end of Act 4. Little Riches. <laughs> yeah. How are you going to sort that out? Um, so, yes, end of Act 4 and... Crafty Act. Question time! But, yeah, no, he's really no polluting the whole... Uh, <laughs> You're not allowed to interfere in the culture. Well, what about yeah? What about contaminating it with human DNA? <laughs> Is that uh, I mean, particularly yeah. since there's like twelve people left in the world? You know, it's that's actually thick. not a big I enough mean, gene pool, is it? That's not a big enough gene pool. To oh no, there's a very strong possibility in twenty or thirty generations they'll die out. But uh, apparently, in in times in in the past, humans have been reduced to as little as two thousand people. And a, a world, and there was there was an Adam. There was there's one male we're all descended from. There's one female we're all descended from. Now they lived like a hundred thousand years apart, but they're called Adam and Eve in genetic circles because every single person they've tested has been traced back to one or the other. So yeah, there's been various bottlenecks in our past. Uh, sorry. So the question: Forks leave the holodeck to end up in ten forward. Well, what deck is the holodeck on? A nine, B ten, C eleven, D twelve. Um, bonus question: Rachel Garrett was the captain of which F- Enterprise? Uh. Uh, also known as the Red Lady. That might help some of you. Um, yeah. Any uh, trivia's for this act, Madam Bob? Um, give me just a second. Um, uh, just, just while you're doing that, I'll throw in a quick fact. Rachel Garrett okay. was confirmed today to be in the Section Thirty One film. 
Which mm. is why I used her as a question. Sorry, no, no, mm. no free twerps. Can't wait. Mm. Well, that makes it slightly more interesting. Uh, trips. Do I have any trips? Let's see. Not very much. Um, during the so uh, the outside shots that they did, you know, when they were climbing along the cliff edge and stuff. The the um, the, uh, the 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 alien alien planet that definitely wasn't again a California countryside. Yes. Did you say where that was? No, but it, I mean, it looked like all the other planets that... they ever go to, doesn't it? Yeah, it was Griffith Park, uh, Bronson Canyon. Isn't Bronson Canyon or Bronson Cave? Wasn't that the one that we saw the other week with the yep. caves? Yeah, exactly yeah. the same place. Same place, uh, right? Yeah. The, the Batman same place. Caves, Darmac and Jalaka, Tanagra. Um, did I send you guys on the video of Tom Scott talking about the 30 mile rule? So yes, basically, we, yeah. The other week when we talked about that cave. Yeah, so if you, if you have to go more than 30 miles from your studio, they have to pay you extra money and pay mm. for hotels and things. Travel so there's a reason why they use Bronson Canyon, because it's within 30 miles of, of Hollywood, pretty much. Mm. So the reason why I mention it is because on the 2nd of November, um, there were heavy wildfires in the area. And... Um, oh, no. Uh, so uh, Alexander Singer was thankful that the area they'd chosen didn't burn down, but they did have to have a break in filming. So that's why I'm wondering whether the timing with the episodes, if they had to stop filming for a number of days, mm. um, because obviously the, the area didn't burn down, so they were able to, to go back uh, and carry on filming, but it did cause an interruption in their filming schedule. Mm. So I'm wondering whether they started filming it and then had to stop and but I don't, I don't know how, you know, surely the episodes aren't shown fast enough that that would have made a big difference to the to the order of play. I don't know. But um, anyway, that's the only reason why I could think that it might have been shown out of order. No, the production and release uh, schedule, it was uh, bang on point. So it was pro it was produced in, in the right order with the other episodes. Sometimes they do shoot the odd scene, though, out, out, outside of that. But, uh, you know, um, for the main, most part, it was it was in order. So, no idea why they weren't shown chronologically. There you go, that's all that, I have for that. Oh, I'm crumbs. It's a bit slim pickings. Crumbs. Slim pickings. You see, I think most Larry people have answered already, but I'm sure Sean will fill any, mm. any dead air. <laughs> Larry Nemechek, Dr. Trek, who you should subscribe to on on uh, on, on uh, YouTube, um, who did the TNG companion guide, probably has some handwritten notes and would know the exact reason because he's that type of nerd. But uh, unfortunately, he's not here for me to ask him. Uh, yeah, so it was 10. Yeah, was I mean, the fact that, that this um, wildfire happened came from the Next Generation companion. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he, but, he goes yeah. live on on YouTube every Tuesday. I always tune into him. It's very interesting. But um, and it, it, it's it, only thirty or forty people tune in, so you can just chat with him. But he he wrote uh, as I said, he was he was involved with the fact files. He did the TG companion. A lot of the stuff that we all read on these all these guides, if he didn't write it down, it would have been lost to history. So yeah, what complete numpty you. would have collected all of the fact files? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, some, yeah. Some even I ran out of steam. I kind of got, I got, I got to fifteen, sixteen, and I started drinking more, and I, I kind of fell out of it. But I guess I was a different age too. Um, yeah. So it was B ten, deck ten. Uh, yeah, he went to ten forward. They were on the same deck. Yeah. It was mentioned in dialogue. It was nice continuity. They didn't get that wrong, and um, because it was on a different deck, it would have been harder to make that make sense. And Rachel Garrett was the captain of the sea. Can you tell me who was the captain of the Enterprise refit before Kirk took over? Sorry, I'll ask you that question again, Monty. Can you tell me who was the captain of the Enterprise refit before Kirk took over? In the motion picture, and then he demotes him. Decker. Yeah. And the Enterprise B? Can't remember the captain in B. Don't tell me Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, everything was Tuesday, wasn't it? They don't have a tractor beam that yeah. comes Tuesday. They yeah, don't have that, phases, that was Captain that Harriman. Comes Tuesday. And, uh, it was from Ferris Bueller's Day Out. I know that. <laughs> yeah, the the D the D and E we know, of course, was Picard. F we don't know, but we did see uh, Shelby in charge of it. But she was an admiral. It was just a temporary thing. And of course, the G is. 
The G is seven and nine. Seven and nine. There you go. Indeed. So everybody answered B and C. Stupam almost answered B and D. I was like, what? You don't know the captain of the Enterprise D? But then he was like, no, no, it's C. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So yeah, everybody answered B and C. So it's, I can keep this then. I can just spin it, can I? I can just spin my wheel. If it's got everyone on it. I like to spin my wheel. It makes me happy. I'm going to spin it. And it's spinning. Yeah, I've been, keep, I've been keeping track of um, Mr. T's and Time Lord's guesses, but they both guessed A for this one, so no points for them, unfortunately. Ruth! Ruth, 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 Ruth. Well done, Ruth. Ruth got the points. Well deserved. It's been a little while nice. since we've had Ruth come up on the uh, on the wheel. Yeah, we've yeah we've been fairly ruthless. Ruthless. Uh, yes. Dear. Uh, dear. Oh. No, pushed the wrong button. Okay, Act Five. <laughs> We're into the final act. We're on the homeward straight. There's a. So Mazza just put in. Do you not know the captain of the D? And that just. That just tickles me. Please, please continue. <laughs> I am the captain of the I D. I am the captain of the D. Yes. I decide who will No, I guess every man's the captain of his own D, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, unless you've drank too much and it just won't happen for you. But Luckily, he has, a nice, he has a nice shiny head. Oh, dear. Okay, so um, the Enterprise is here. It's arrived. It's not that common. It is a big deal. It doesn't happen to every guy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just like this shot uh, of the uh, you know Enterprise nice, arriving. Nice D pick. Nice D pick. Um, yeah, it's nice that I, they're I, not right way up, you know. Yeah, yeah, not not the standard orientation. Okay, or, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it up just from this angle. What model's that? Um, I'd say Ooh. that's the bigger one. It's fairly detailed. Or no, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the... it's got to be the four footer. I thought the four footer had more. Detail. Oh, oh no, sorry, no, you're right. The four footer has more detail. That's the one that did second. Yeah, I, I would think so. Footer. It's the six foot. Yeah, you can tell. It's got the thin, yeah. the thin edge. It's very smooth. Very smooth. Yeah, oh. that is your six foot model there, not the four foot one. Smooth well, it still, it still has a lovely bit of detail, you know, that they have like the panels of maybe that's the remastered thing, but Oh yeah, I think I think the the six foot is a beautiful model in its own right. Mm. It just yeah, it doesn't have like the bumpiness. It doesn't have all the bumpy detail on it that the four foot yeah. one has. Well, do you know do you know what they have a word for that? They call yeah. it uh, as Aztecing. The Aztecing, um, yeah, it doesn't have the Aztec. Because the Aztec kinda kinda spire or square kind of plat patterns um, yeah. in their art. I mean yeah, like the Enterprise A has Aztecing on it, but it's purely mm. done in paint, like with Parless and mm. paint. So it has an Aztec mm. design painted on it. They um as did this one slightly. But the D has the Aztecing on it as actual like imprint, like it's actually yeah. like texture. Mm. Yeah, you can tell it's it's really good. Yeah. Okay, so they arrive at the planet. Day reports that they're in orbit above the beam down site. Ooh! Yeah, I know. I oh, just he put has the, a I face on. He had a little snarly face on his I head. Actually like, put, like you're a naughty child. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't usually go to the detail of saying that we're in orbit of the planet and we're at the beam down site, but I literally just put that in there just for Tavi, just for the data shot. That was the only reason uh -huh. that was included. Oh my goodness. So uh, Jordi is having issues though sorting out the beam down process. Uh, at and the holodeck is currently falling apart. Um, so they might have to transport them whether they are ready or not. The I, card I, goes... I like that shot... Sorry, just before you move on. I like that shot where Riker has his hand on his right headrest. It is, Riker's got nice to be leaning on hold... somebody else's thing, isn't it? Whether he's sat on somebody's console, he's parked his ass <laughs> on somebody's console, or he's got his foot and his crotch in somebody's face. Here... 
he's leaning <laughs> on Picard's armrest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he just can't help Patrick himself. Stewart. There's snow on your back. Yeah, but Patrick Stewart, naturally being right-handed when he goes to get up, is going to end up holding hands with him. That's just awkward. How? It's why? Snowing. Oh my god! There's snow on my dog. It's actually snowing in Plymouth. <laughs> in March. Like in March. Well, nearly April. Do you remember about five years ago, The Beast from the East? Mm. It was around this time of year. Mm. It was, because it was my bloody 40th birthday and we got stranded in Lanzarote. Yeah, oh. I remember. But I mean, there was a good two, three foot of snow. <laughs> Mark I mean, remembers was... distinctly us having to fly to Scotland and then he drove us all, <laughs> about to fly to us all the way down from Scotland. Down oh, what was that? Plymouth, What's that, 10 hours? All throughout the night, yeah. Hmm. Yikes! That was wow. okay. that was something. I wouldn't After enjoy waiting that, no. in the waiting in the airport for about eight hours, and then flying to Wondering Edinburgh we're gonna get to drive to Plymouth via Bristol to pick up my car. Really big fat snow. It was the first and last holiday I flew Ryanair. I'll never do that again. <laughs> so it's, yeah, my, my relationship will, with repeat, Ryanair ended that day. Oh, I <laughs> I, I I used to know some of the Ryanair staff, and uh, I I lived to the Ryanair hub. And any time I got on the plane, I used to say hello to him, and they used to bring me up the front and give me free beer. So it used to be great. <laughs> nice. Don't have that anymore. No. Uh, and wow. uh, actually, the guy the guy who runs Ryanair, who's a billionaire, used to go to the same gym as me. And it's not mm. sort of any exclusive gym. It's like twenty nine euro a month gym that you just use because my office used to be exactly beside the Ryanair building, and it was only about a hundred yards up the road to the gym. But you, you just walk into the gym useless and you go. You, 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 but you just walk into the gym changing room, you know, and you're not really looking at anyone or anything when you're going changing your clothes. And then you go, "There's billionaire Michael O'Leary with his bollocks out, like drying himself." Okay. Why, why are you looking at a billionaire's <laughs> That's happening. bollocks? Because I was okay. curious what a billionaire's bollocks looked like. Don't, don't do that, Sean. No, just don't don't do that. <laughs> no, how Sean, many times? How many times have you been in the same room as a billionaire? Just you and the billionaire. I'm going to check out all this stuff. Do it, Sean, and then tell us about it like you're doing now. It's very good. I, I'm, ex I'm exaggerating the fact that he was clean as bollocks. He wasn't. But, I mean, this is like the one and only time me and a billionaire in a room together and nobody else was there. <laughs> Ruth says the two worst things to come out of Ireland is Ryan Eyre and Mrs. Brown's boys. I'm oh, I met him too. I'm not sure Mrs. I... Brown's boys actually comes out of Ireland, does it? Well, it, well, it's produced by BBC, but it's Brendan O'Carroll's idea. I, I, yeah, I met him once. He used to be a waiter in a restaurant that my father and my mother used to go to, and uh, he was playing down in Waterford. And uh, my father met him in the pub afterwards and said, "I, I used to know you when you were living in Ashburn," and he said, "Oh, gra oh, Jesus, I remember you now." And he organised tickets for my whole family for the next night for free, and we all went to see the show. I was 12, and it was an over-18 show. Uh, nice guy. Yeah. Mrs. Brown Boys is terrible, but he's lovely it's in person. It's terrible. It but, is. Yeah, Ireland is so small, my dad awful. knew. Anyway. Yeah, and Ireland is so small. <laughs> Sorry. Shop Sean. Uh, let's get on with the this final act. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's get there. Um, so, Picard goes to visit Vorin to see uh, what he wants to do. Uh, he wants to go back to his people. But he doesn't know what to tell them. Would they think he's mad? Or would they just not believe him? Either way, he realises he can't tell them anything. He has to live with this secret forever, which doesn't uh, please him at all. Picard tells him that there is another option. He could stay aboard with them on the Enterprise. Foreign needs more time to think about it. None of those options seem particularly palatable. So, of course, Picard just leaves him on his own. <laughs> yeah, because that's what you do when someone's that's what you do suicidal. When you got someone very vulnerable like that, you just leave them to their own devices. <laughs> Wolf confronts Nikolai about mating with Dobra. Nikolai's like, well, that's private just between us. Wolf thinks he's only thinking with his dingaling, and has dishonored Dobra and her people. Nikolai, though, has plans. He wants to stay. He wants to start a family. Wolf's like, oh, 
No, you're not. You're coming back with me, matey. So the brothers go to start a fight on the holodeck, but the holodeck itself starts to fall apart. It's not good. <laughs> the holodeck is literally peeking through. Wolf and Nikolai encourage them to take refuge in their tents as the storm has returned, and Wolf signals Geordie to create a storm to hide the fact. Geordie's like, OK, I'll give it a go. He's like laughing away in engineering. You know, their whole plan's falling apart. Yeah. The, uh, the, the yeah, I've got to let him attempt to direct the, the fate of a species is at risk, and he's having a jolly old time yeah. and laughing. Crow Storm was like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. <laughs> you know, people get a, get a give you a bit of fun of creating a bit of theater. So yeah. Speaking of someone as part of production. <laughs> I mean, just, he is uh, the forge in this case. He is like now a demigod to these people, and that was just yeah. thrown in there. <laughs> like, if these people survive, the forge is going to be a deity. The forge Another comes sign forth. of the forge coming up. <laughs> Let there be lightning, and there was lightning. <laughs> my 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 brothers were at, were at a midnight mass. I don't know if you have them in in uh, we do. UK, but basically, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So if you're Catholic, Christmas. for those who don't know. Yeah, if you don't want to go to Mass on Christmas Day, you go to Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve so you can take the day off. And anyway, my brothers went to one of these and um, and uh, someone was doing a reading and they said, and let there be light. And then the power cut off just immediately <laughs> afterwards. And like 500 people who were all drunk from coming in from the pub just burst into rapturous <laughs> laughter. Just couldn't have been more perfect. The Antichrist. Um... The, so... Uh, the villagers rush to their tents, and once they're all in, Wolf signals to Geordie to energize, and they all beam down to the planet. This is like them starting the beaming process. They arrive in pretty much a similar sort of clearing as what they left, but of course, nice uh, skies. And they all emerge from their tents. I will say, I did notice this guy here in the middle. He, he's not even in a tent. He just stands up from behind this tent here. He just, he just like pops up. Oh uh, yeah. He's like, he's like hello. Yeah, that's that's stagecraft. <laughs> it's like he didn't even go in his tent, but he doesn't seem bothered. At least he, he even starts life. Homelessness he, is a thing. He doesn't mention it. He doesn't go. Oh, that was weird. <laughs> when we all disappeared and we reappeared again. He's like fine. <laughs> He just wanders around, staring at the weird sky and stuff. So Monty, then we get a have I ever, did, did I ever ask you, have you ever had sex while camping? I hear it's fucking intense. Oh, no. My bum didn't work. Oh, there we go. That's very good. Um, oh, so the, the, the yeah. captain's log summarizes that they were indeed successful, but at a high price. It turns out that maybe Vorin shouldn't have been left alone. Beverly tells Picard that Vorin died of some kind of ritual suicide. But she also says, you know, on the bright side, he would have died back on the planet anyway. So it's not really a biggie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel like this, I, I, I wasn't expecting this. I didn't remember this that he kills himself, and yeah. I was like, "Oh, Poor it's really sad." It's kind of put a bit of a bummer on the episode. No, yeah, it's, her, it's, that, that, her hair, her hair looks fabulous. Look at those waves. Look how it's. It's sweet. a wig. It's not a wig. Oh. It's not a wig. This one isn't a wig. No, she she ditched the wig halfway through the last season. No, oh, the uh, sixth season. Halfway through the sixth season. I We even noted the episode where the wig disappeared. Oh, okay. Uh, Isn't that so cool? Like, a, ma like a man in orthopedic shoes, I stand corrected. Yes, yes. Picard points out that, yes, he died. Uh, uh, yes, um, he would have died, but this way he died alone and afraid, which is sad. But on balance... It was probably worth it as the 
as our plan worked out perfectly. I like the way in that scene that both the, the doc was kind of like, well, he would have died anyway. So it's, it's a, you know, it's not a, 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 a pro or a, or a loss. And then Picard claims the whole plan as their plan. Well, yeah. our plan well, worked out successfully, so it was worth it. It wasn't his plan. Yeah. It's like a typical yeah. boss, isn't it? When it all goes well, claim it as your own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, the, that's the manager attitude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's talking yeah. about this dead guy, even in this moment. He's talking about him as an, oh, I wish I could have known him. I was hoped he was going to be the bridge in between our two peoples. I'm like... 15 minutes ago you're talking about just let everybody freaking die like what plus i wanted to get to him <laughs> plus picard visits him alone without his counselor without the the professional the guy is obviously in massive distress and is like you know my whole world's falling apart i i, I don't know how i'm going to cope and because like okay well i'll just leave you alone for a couple of hours <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> that didn't work out well anyway so then we go back down to the planet and Worf says his goodbyes to his brother telling him that he has given these people a new chance at life Nikolai is going to take up Vorin, uh, Vorin's role as uh, the chronicle keeper though Worf thinks that's funny because his brother can't draw uh, Worf wishes him and his continued. Uh, oh yeah, Worf wishes him and his continued pollution of this people's culture uh, the best. Uh, and he asks if he can keep the remaining scroll, which Nikolai agrees to, uh, robbing these people of the one little piece of heritage that they had left. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was like. Why on earth? Like literally, they've just lost their entire civilization, and the one thing their history yeah, yeah, book left. that the guy who's killed himself said was the most important thing ever. Uh, Watch just going to stroll off with it. Well, I fancy that from the wall. Put it on his wall. All right then. Like a well decoration. I, I remember I mean, reading before. What the. I, I was going to say, I remember reading before that everything we know about the Roman Empire came from a book, but the book was a, 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 like a compendium, a volume. It was one of three, and uh, the other two were lost to history. So everything we know is only like a third of the history contained in one historical account. <laughs> you know? the, like things we know about the, the Romans and the Greeks, and we know a lot, but we know maybe 1% of what we probably could know because of all the lost books. Well, it's like through through the golden era of the Roman Empire. Yeah, is through um, Caesar's own words because he um, he wrote about all his conquests. He kept a journal, and they were published back in Rome so that everybody could. It's kind of like he was really good at self publicizing, but it means that everything we know about the Roman Empire and their yeah, accomplishments are all through julius caesar himself like that's the only source we Pretty have much. it's well, a very we good know. source but it's rather one-sided <laughs> i can imagine it yeah and um yeah a lot of, uh, so much of our history but it what it, it is a thing when when um like in the pre-internet era or even in the modern era you know um when a new person comes to the throne the first thing they do is burn all the books because mm. they don't want stories of other leaders or other you know like actually you see you see it in star trek with with uh with the klingons and they contact the klingons and go he's busy rewriting history you know yeah. <laughs> history is written by the victors like literally klingon history just constantly changes because every time a new leader comes along they burn all the books and they start again to make themselves look better and uh yeah but like, yeah we, we really don't know what we don't know put it that way I'm surprised Putin hasn't had any book burning exercises yet. It seems like something you well, might be doing. Well, right the internet still exists. So there's only so much you can do. Mm, that's true. So um, no, we it doesn't exist in the modern era the way it used to, but uh, certainly he tries to censor the internet and block what you can and can't see and things. But uh, yeah, so I, yeah. I mean, I mean, 
I just want to just say Afghan that Nikolai agreed to give him the scrolls. There they are. And Wolf tells him that he will tell their mother that he is happy. I just wanted to get that out of the way because now I can say that that's the end of the episode. <laughs> We're done. Couldn't he just replicate it? He could even give the replica copy back to the planet. They wouldn't know any better. I mean, it's just bonkers. Um, Before we do anything, I want to say let's call an end to the bingo so Tavi can start totting. Okay, yes, bingo but, ending. Bingo but I, ending I didn't even mention I didn't even mention Battlestar Galactica. No. No, you no, didn't. Too late. <laughs> it's, it's closed. It's done. And it is question time. It's question time. It's last question time. Okay. It's time for questions. It's question time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to miss this the next five or six weeks. Uh, so, first question. Which sitcom did Brent Spiner recently appear on up in charges in front of a judge? So... Bit of a courtroom kind of situation. Some people may know what he was in. A uh, bit of a revival from something he did just shortly before TNG came along. And the bonus question: Penny Johnson's character, which is Cassidy Yates, also gets pregnant in DS9. But who was dipping in the chocolate? In other words, who got her pregnant? Who was dipping in the chocolate? Yeah, I've, I've gone full filth here. Is that something that actually just came you, out of your mouth, John? Is that, is that something you actually yeah, said? Yeah, well, Tammy took us to weird places and I'm just going with it. You may you may notice my background, um, which is a perfectly normal couch. Uh, requires no further scrutiny. Uh, um... Steve Plum keeps repeatedly letting us know that it's snowing outside. Um, I tried to tell him that we had this discussion 15, 20 minutes ago when Chewie came in covered in snow, but uh, I, I, I don't think he's reading my response. Did he, did he not, we know did it's he not snowing. Know? Well, I know, we know. <laughs> might, yes. might have tuned out for a moment. He might he, But yeah, he it's actually that. starting to lay a little bit. Like my grass is looking white out there. It's, uh, That's mental. This is very exciting. Very Sounds exciting like... this time of year. It does not yeah, snow. at all, frankly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to drop below freezing overnight here. It's um, yeah, I'm really sick of it at this stage. But yeah, it looks like we're that time of year. I guess Night Court, but it's wrong because it's not. It's not a comedy. But I don't it's think it's hardly a drama. It's it's a drama, isn't it? Is it? Is it? I don't know. I, we don't have it in England, uh, so I've, I've never seen it. No, no, we didn't, but we've mentioned it on the show a few times, so. I have no idea. I but know it did come back recently. Me, my top spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, no idea. Anyway, I don't have much in the way of trips and goofs anyway for this final act. Um, the footage of the planet, is it Vaca 6? Um, mm. is a reuse of uh, Kronos from Sins of the Father. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in this act, it's so lovely to see Worf with a softer expression and using his eyebrows. It's yeah, so it's lovely. nice. Yeah. He can emote. Yeah. It's really... He can. It, he can it's properly... like when you, when you see Lavara's big brown eyes and you're just like, whoa. Oh, God. yeah. Like, that guy can stare into your soul and then they just put this thing on his eyes. So you're like, <laughs> oh. Of nice. all the people to do that to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, if, I, if you need an interrogator for a crime, you just need to stare at you and you can just see it straight through you. Uh, no problem. It's cool. I feel like you got a thing for his eyes right now. <laughs> he has, has got, got, some he has got damn amazing fine eyes. eyes. He has got amazing eyes. It's, it's true. It's, they're they're he so has famous eyes, you know. Which is hilarious that they gave him that role. <laughs> it's just funny, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it's just it's a great casting irony that they just took that away from him, which is probably why he has an acting career at all. His eyes are so expressive. Okay, so answers to the questions, then, Sean. All right, yeah. So yeah, Night Court was absolutely correct. Was it? Um, yes, it was a sitcom. Yeah. Was it a sitcom? Yeah, of course it was, yeah. I never knew. And, um, I always thought it was like a drama. 
No, no, it's, he, he played this kind of country bumpkin type that always gets pulled up on charges for the silliest of reasons. Wow. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was Cisco in the in the second part. Cassidy Yates, well, she was Cassidy Cisco at the end, I suppose. Uh, yeah, she she was uh, the Cisco's baby mama. So we've got me, Tavi, uh, Ruth. It's a shame for um, Mr. T and Time Lord, you guessed A and B because it wasn't a multiple choice. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah like there. This, this, this is a hard, hard episode to write questions for, so I had to go really off script. So this is what you have to do. There's um, nothing from Chris. I don't think, unless I can't. I'm not seeing it. So it's just. Was oh it yeah, maybe he's not on. Ruth. Um, no stuplum. No so stuplum. Um, Tavi, Ruth, and. Mazda. Just the four, the four and Sean. Right. I'm there. I'm spinning the wheel. I'm praying for Ruth. Winny, 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 winny. It is... Oh, no. I probably Sean. needed the points because I think I've had a bit of a mare. Oh, monkey. I had a bit of a mare this evening, so I probably needed that extra point. There we go. Ten I won points the final for spin. the Monty. There we go. We'll leave you to uh, Alex scores now. Start thinking about what you'd like to give this episode out of ten. From zero to ten, what would you guys give it? Um, let us know in live chat. And then while you're at it, uh, think about hitting that like button, or you know, hit the notification bell, or. Ask your friends and family to subscribe to our poor little channel because it desperately needs your help. Yes. Like grandmas love, How are we doing on Grandmas stuff? love TNG. Any Aunts and uncles, you know, they all love TNG. Uh, get them to subscribe, please. Anyway, yeah. I feel like I feel like we do like I don't know if it was tired time, Lord, who put that in my mind, but the, the Sarah McLaughlin ASPCA sort of ad, but just have like a whole bunch of you know rejected characters or 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 whatnot and bad trekkies. Yeah, asking asking also for the subs and just hear Sarah McLaughlin in the background. In the arms of me. <laughs> Tammy, have have you seen that Night Court episode, the new one? I ha not the new one. No, I saw some. I read about it and I saw some screenshots. Yeah, well, it's out. I'm sure you can find it if you uh, sail the seven seas of the internet. Wow, yeah. it was out two weeks ago. I will have to check. I would I never condone money. such an activity. Well, I did the show in Norway, so. What are you um, talking about? I will, I will find a, yeah. a very. Very... Lindy Hop is out in the snow. My God, is that <laughs> is that in Plymouth right now? Yeah, that's in our parents' back garden. Who it is? <laughs> what? That's mad. Yeah. Wow. You want to is that an Ukrainian group, Duplum? That that's just that's just Stuplum taking some footage. Wow. Is that a, a nap? Is yeah. that what? Was that like an app playing in the snow, or was that real snow? No, that was just that was just um, no, that was just Stuplum taking footage in our back garden right now, in his right back now. garden right now. Mm. Wow. Anyway. Yeah, it is great. Way. Right. Well, let's get this finished so I can go and prance about in the snow in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> Turn your dog into a snowball. Mm. Let me look over and see who's got the 50 points for the best dad joke. Okay. Oh, yes. I will bring That's up the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet of scores. <clears throat> there it is. Season 7. And Homewood, isn't it? Homewood. There we go. Right. Maz, how are you doing with the scoring up? Um, I can't 
do any oh oh we've got the bingo sorry yeah um that's fine i'll add those now we've got a seven from Stuplam and oh. a seven from roof so that would be a seven that'll be that'll be a seven Average. from i don't think we'll be getting any others so i i, I think i'll no. put audience there at seven um, I do have some reception Easter, but it's going to be hard to sort of read and type at the same time. Um, but there were some people who uh, were quite critical of this episode in terms of, um, you know, oh my John God. Luke and the whole... Smile the Rainbow's been out in it. I've been out in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. But Tavik must be kids? just like laughing at us because this is like literally her every day anything. covered yeah. in snow all the time. But for us, it's such a novelty. It's deep, it's really fun. I, I love it. I know how it's so painful it is when you don't Sorry. get snow often and you do. It's amazing. We haven't like had snow in years, so it's a bit of a like oh, a. It's, a, it's yeah. a very big novelty for us. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's like when I was growing up, it was illegal nearly to walk across someone's snow because everyone waited to take photos of their house covered in <laughs> snow like White like Christmas. I'm on yeah, the fence. Yeah, the same. Go ahead. It's like in the UK, you wouldn't get a field of like snow that people haven't walked across. Like people just love the be the first one and stuff like that mm. um and then when i was working in like sort of romania and poland and places like that they were just so i mean like literally a, a meter would lay overnight with just insane amount of snow and um they're all like laughing at me taking pictures they were like oh girl from Devon, never seen snow um and uh uh and there was all these areas where like it's just pristine snow that's in the middle of a city that nobody's actually walked across and i thought that just would never happen in England. Like somebody would just want to be the first one to put their footprints, but nobody cares. It's just so calm, common. It's yeah, they stick. I mean, when I yeah. In the doorway, I would just stop on the side of the road, like walking to the bus stop, full full mourning for everyone else. And it's the snow, and and everyone's like, I'm like, is no one gonna stop and play with the snow? Have you guys gotten so bored with snow? So I would be the one person. <laughs> In my business suit, just flip back into the snow, making snow angels in the morning. <laughs> Loved it. People are like, this woman yeah. is crazy. Well, I would say, well, in the southwest of England, cli climate is much the same as Ireland. I realize in Scotland, they're probably a lot more used to it. But I mean, if you saw 10 days of snow in the year, that would be a lot. You know, occasionally, like the beast from the east five years ago, we got like a couple of foot of snow and it hung around for i don't know about two weeks and you know businesses shut down and buses couldn't run and all sorts of things but yeah that's not normal mm. it's just I um do indeed yeah. have scores now right hey so, I'm, I'm still wait 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 i still have to decide the bit of the dad jokes and i'm on the oh, bed yeah, do we have any icebreakers it is in between again our dad joke champion Stu Plum and and I can't. There's a lot of noise coming from sorry, somewhere. Sorry, sorry. Can you sorry, leave? Can you leave? Come on, Jimmy. Take Chewy. Can't hear. I can't hear them. Yeah. They <laughs> can't hear themselves. Oh, yeah. Panting it like a doggy. <laughs> no. Sorry, Tavi. Who just? Who'd you say it was between? It's in between Stu Plum and the beard. So the jokes are: ah. from Stu Plum, a man walked into a bar. It hurt. It was an iron bar. And, and the second and the, and the other contender is from Miss, from the beard. Why did the lobster blush? Because he saw the ocean's bottom. <laughs> so, I, 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 I like I like the second one better, but if you want to we I can let the wheel we, we can let the wheel decide. Yes. Oh, Take yes, it to the wheel, Monty. Tiebreaker. Okay. Uh, the beard versus Stu Plum. Versus lobster. Copy, copy, copy. Oh. No. Uh oh, what? it just snuck in a load oh. into the bar. bar one. Oh my god, Stu Plum is stomping out with an extra hundred in this episode. <laughs> 
Wow. Well, that, despite that, that, that being do 50 things. points, that makes no difference to the actual standings. It does mean that he is a hair's breadth off somebody rather than being a bit further back, but um, the, it did not make a difference to the standings, shockingly. So, yeah. Okay, are you ready for the scores? Yeah, ready. Okay, so um, in first place with 435 TNG review points is... Tampkins, who hasn't had a chance Whoa. to play that much recently. So no. amazing that you've been able to pop it in there with max low points. What? Yeah. And then 25 points behind with 410 is Monty Ban. Really? You got nine what? points on the board. Yeah. How did that happen? I got like three questions wrong. Oh, I'm no, shocked. No, you got one question wrong. Did I? Yeah, I, I thought I got more than that wrong. All right, oh. well, I'll I'll take it. I will take it. Uh, so that's what. And then in place, only ten points behind you would have been sixty points behind you. Um, is Stuplum with eight points? Eight points. So that's and then uh, next. Yeah, and then next, I mean, I hope I haven't done Ruth a disservice here because I think next is myself um, with 340 points. Um, just let me check in. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, uh, so that would be myself with seven points. Mm -hmm. And then next with 240 points is Chris. And then, so he's got six points. And then only five points behind him is Ruth with five points. Am I going too fast? No. Um, and then next is Smiler. Um, so she's got finger points, 40 points. Um, so she gets uh, four points. And then is Gujon with 30 finger points. So he gets three points. And then is finally Tired Time Lord, who um, has 20 points, mostly bingo, got also some points earlier, but also had a minus 10 when we called a Sean on the black yeah. hole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was that two points? Uh, yes, for a Tired Time Lord, yes, two points. There we go. So, okay, yeah, it's a, only a slight change, just, I think, myself and you, Mass, uh, swap, swap positions there. Uh, oh, and Stuplum's popped above roof. Oh, and Stuplum's popped above roof. They're still mega roof. close. It is mega close. There we go. So who's going to be the champion of champions? Wow, yeah. Uh, okay, Tavi just realized that the cup she was using is like twice the, the volume she thought it was, so she's been giving herself doubles all night. <laughs> no, and, and I mean, she, she's horny in the night, and it's not even the, the horny candle night. You know, that's next week. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to do this next week. I'm looking forward to the sex candle. Uh, well, I, I mean, I only get to watch it back, you know, I catch it for the last 20 sex minutes or so. Candle. Right, yeah. Um, pedals. 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 Pedal time. Everything sounds so dirty tonight. Yeah. That's, that's a paddling. You ready? You be good. <laughs> oh, you okay. get this. Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Seven, seven six, six four. seven four. Shush, Sean. Shush, Sean. No, seven. Chew. Six. It's chew, very yes, excited. Seven, it's still snowing. Four. Everyone's very excited. Is he, at the, is he working at the snow? Yeah, he's uh, he's never seen snow before, so he's just like uh, he's oh no, yeah, of course, he's no. only like two years old, isn't he? Yeah, he's only two years old. So he's never seen snow, on. so he's just super excited. He's bouncing oh. off of the walls and stuff. Uh, Bless him. Yeah. This is a fire. Oh my god! I want to so go out funny. there and see him in it, so I'm just trying to 
Um, so this is one of the worst episodes then this season so far and I think that's pretty much oh don't worry there's always next week (laughs) well it's one of the worst I mean it actually works out to be like third worst joint third worst still above average like in terms of if you think of five as being an average but yeah it's season seven though so I mean even the worst episode of TNG at this point is still like great television isn't it really but uh... well I mean you could you can tell they have a little bit more budget and you can tell they're taking chances that they're trying things because they know there's no more so they, they don't have to worry about getting cancelled <laughs> I think this I think, uh, the, I, I, I think the actors are slightly looser as well like you yeah. know they're coming to the end of the run they're enjoying themselves yeah. a little more I think yeah they, they, they know the, the gig is up so they're just having fun they're having a bit more fun you can tell a little you know glimmer behind the eyes that they're just like you know they're having a bit of a laugh with it and uh, it's just nice you know it's nice but for me this episode it just the way that to make it work they have to stick rigidly to the um to the prime directive when mm. you know a lot of other situations where you know they flaunted the prime directive when it suits them you know to save save the whole species to save these people um citing the prime directive as a reason just seems to me always since since watching as a teenager just seems against the sort of characters and the the ethics that i think starfleet should stand for and i just never liked it i just Mm. never liked that concept so it always really annoyed me yeah well, I, I mean, I understand in the terms of the temporal prime directive, going back to it, if you save it, actually, Doctor Who does this brilliantly. Uh, there's an episode of Doctor Who where the doctor saves a child uh, from death in a, in a, in a minefield. And uh, anyway, it turns out it's Davros, who's the creator of the Daleks. Um, and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. It's one of the Capaldi episodes, if you've not seen it. And it's fantastic. But it proves the point that, you know, if you save a life in the past, how do you know they're not going to turn out to be the next Hitler? It's like history has happened and you shouldn't interfere with it. But history has happened. But, you know, you, but yeah, I mean, what's the harm in transporting a uh, sentient, you know, colony to a new planet? I mean, yeah, it's, you're just going to let the whole culture die instead? Yeah, I, don't, I don't get it. I, and you know what's messed up is that the, a little ep- uh, while ago, Data was talking to some pin pal, and because this child asked Data for help, Picard was like, "Well, this All is different. Right, then. Uh, we've got <laughs> we've got a we've got a plea for help. It's different from you know the Prime Directive." I was like, "So if these people ask you for help, is it different?" What? Yeah, absolutely. But it's also like, like uh, I, I kind of alluded to during the um, the episode, you know, if if a culture's reached a certain re- reached a certain uh, sophistication where they've got like warp drives and things, then the Federation would swoop in and help them out. But <laughs> if they haven't reached that technological advanced mm. stage, then they'll just stand by and just literally stand there on the edge of their in orbit of their planet and just watch them die. <laughs> it's yeah. just well I mean, yeah, it's like watching imagine that like right now currently we are not warp capable. So if there's a speed it'd be like them looking at us going, Nope, those dumbass driving around in Teslas. They yeah. haven't gotten out here. Nope. Nope. Slow them die. Hmm. Slow them Does die. anyone ever- I was Gonna say some uh, reception stuff earlier, and we we um we did like the the the, the, the dad joke uh, points, but there are some people online who have panned this episode for saying you know all this um, self righteous twaddle and uh, Picard is uh, compassionless, heartless, despicable. Uh, the point of the Prime Directive is to kind of Im- avoid imperialism, you know, to mm. stop us from contaminating and taking over other cultures. You know that whole non interference with their progression. You know, yeah. on the assumption that there's going to be some kind of progression, but letting an entire culture die for no good reason is appalling. Mm, but then yeah. other people say, um, you know, 
okay, but maybe that's why they spend so much time talking about the Prime Directive and reminding each other about the importance of non-interference because they've got situations where, you know, we're talking about living, breathing, sentient beings and basically playing God. And you don't know the consequences of doing that. Mm. You could save their species. They could turn out to be, I don't know, the next Borg or something like that. You've got no idea about the consequences of your long-term actions. So really the only safe thing um, is to stay aloof. And even when it seems impossible, uh, try try not to have any impact at all. But There's also the fact the long... that they go in there and they mask themselves like spying on these people is interference anyway, right? So well, it's interference. You're going to leave a... people alone, leave you... them alone. You, 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 you're going to leave your DNA, your microbes, mm -hmm. your, you know, yeah. what it is, is, I mean, you know, that people... Non-interference should be not going people, and observing them. That people yeah. could have died, but then their genetic soup or whatever that's left or whatever, maybe in a, in a million or billion years' time, actually spawns else. A, a, another race, uh, you know, or, or something. But mm -hmm. if they remove that from the planet, that might never ever get kicked off, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I can understand both sides of it, but the the humanity in me just goes, if I see people dying there, I'm going to want to help them out. I mean... If yeah, you're going to observe to people and if you're going to get to know them, gonna even go, in an academic fashion, you know I mean? yeah. then you, there, there will be some moral imperatives from what you learn. Mm. And you've got to take responsibility for those moral imperatives, I think. But, well, mm. I mean, you, you can even look at it, modern day analogues and the whole give a man a fish, he eats for a day, give a man a fishing rod, he eats for a lifetime. And, you know, sometimes aid can be harmful in the sense that too much aid makes people reliant on aid and it makes people not develop for themselves. I mean, we can see it with Africa in many respects. I realize it was caused by external forces, but also sometimes too much help is, is not helping at all mm. because people just don't develop to solve their own problems when people are trying and to solve it's them It's not just them. aid, though. So when I was in Oslo last week, I went to the Fram Museum, which is all about polar exploration. And one of those um, ones was about, you know, how um, they were there for like about four years and stuff uh, with the, the Fram, which was designed for long term exposure in icy conditions. And they met a bunch of Inuit people who set up a little camp nearby um, and they had really, you know, being that it's back in a time when people conquered people and people, you know, these things didn't generally go very well. They had a really um, good relationship where. Um, the people from the Fram taught them, you know, they, they learned their language so that, that the, um, you know, Norwegian people were able to talk to these Inuit um, and there was some good trading between them and a lot of mutual respect. And um, the Inuits taught them some stuff about, you know, um, uh, how to do like proper clothing. So it was all just, and, and even now the Inuit people talk about, um, you know, these Norwegian explorers in a very positive way. So it was seen as a really positive sort of thing. However, the impact of those Norwegian people, the things that they brought, the things that they left, you know, and um, teaching them about guns or new materials or, you know, still impacted their culture permanently and um, forever, you know, and, and taught them new things, challenged their ideals and then their perception of the world and, and geography and everything and brought those influences in. It wasn't done, you know, with any kind of bad intentions, but at the same time, what's what's the answer then everybody just stays completely insular nobody ever goes anywhere or explores anywhere or communicates with anyone mm. the natural thing about exploration and communication is you're going to have an impact and an influence on the people that you meet and uh, and unfortunately um the people who are perhaps you know less technologically developed will always be the ones that are probably impacted the most sometimes positively sometimes negatively but there will be an impact even if they are you know very very amicable and positive relationships Ruth, yeah well, Ruth, Ruth said this Ruth. reminds me reminds her of uh, the David Attenborough penguins episode I think it was like planet earth or planet earth 2 or something where they uh, they had a strict non-interference policy uh, observing the wildlife around them but then these penguins got stuck in a in a like a bowl and they they couldn't get the out. The moral imperative. And uh, in the end, the uh, crew. It was like in the documentary after the main episode, you saw like the crew um, dug them out. 
they dug the yeah, penguins out so they could live because they were all going to just die. The whole, well, the whole colony was I, just going to die in the middle of this like valley thing. But, uh, I, I, I can respect them respecting the circle of life in terms of, you know, animals feed on other animals. And, you know, although you've been watching this lovely little chicklet hatch from a penguin and you're kind of in love with it and, you know, I don't know, an eagle comes in and swoops it away or whatever. Um, I can kind of respect the fact you just have to leave that happen because it's the natural process of life. But yeah, to just let the colony just die out because they kind of fell into a crevice is kind of like, uh, there's no real reason for that. Uh, with Similar back mm. to this episode, there's no benefit to allowing that to happen. I mean, there's a benefit to not interfering with, you know, um, prey, bur prey creatures, preying creatures, preying on prey, but just to die for natural causes. Uh, yeah. Just to take the analogy one step further, David Attenborough didn't have sex with one of the penguins and have a half penguin, <laughs> half human <laughs> egg. I mean, yeah, it, it throws everything that Worf's brother did into question, right? All of his stuff about, oh, we can't just let them die, blah, blah, blah. You don't care about the culture. You're just looking out for the bird you're in love with and That's this right. like, unborn baby. That's, it was completely selfish motivations. He's you had a that. career in this for what? Um, You're about 50. You've yeah. had a career in doing this, you know, anthropological stuff. And yet suddenly now you want to interfere. Oh, why? Oh, well, because, yeah, you've fallen in love. So, yeah, made it all very questionable from his perspective. Uh, well, no wonder yeah, he didn't care about his career. Oh, your career is over. I don't care. I'm going to well, go shack up with this. Woman. Well, D David Attenborough generally followed the rules, but his brother Richard, now he definitely went off the path. You're saying? I mean, he claimed he, he spared no expense. Dicky Dicky Attenborough <laughs> fucked a penguin. Is that what you're saying? Live yeah. on stream. That's, yeah, that's, he spared no expense. My, my my eye. He he let the whole like, park in the hands of Dennis Nedry away. and didn't pay him properly. I think he has a lot to answer for. That's where he got the DNA from for those dinosaurs. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, on that on that bombshell, <laughs> in the words of uh, Jeremy Clarkson, and on that bombshell, oh, uh, what what have we got next week? Have we got a great episode next week? The candle yeah, episode. Yeah, we know what we've got next week. Oh no! <laughs> Shakara comes out of a candle. Ever. Oh, I can't wait! It's going to be great. I am definitely getting drunk for that one. And I'm on It'll holiday next week. next week. I'm on holiday next week. <laughs> oh. So I don't have to get up for work the next day. So for sub Rosa, I'm getting tanked on stream. I can tell you just to get through it. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Let's have a drunk. <laughs> I'm going to get, I'm going to get, going to have a, a tip oh. next week and join us for the sex candle. You know, I the, said the, I the, wanted the, to, I've been watching a target audience and they've been reviewing Star Trek. They did Q who today. Um, meeting the Borg for the first time, which was good. Um, but you know, they've been drinking Fireball. Is it Fireball or whatever it is the mm. um, cinnamon whiskey? Yeah, I think I might. I might whiskey. get some Fireball yeah. in uh, solidarity with yeah. target audience and try that next week. Never had it. I'll give it a go. Maybe. That'd I do fun. have <laughs> some rather nice whiskey in my decanter at the moment, so um, maybe I will. I will. I will also whiskey with you. Um, but, but it's better than Fireball. <laughs> I just, you know, after what my other half went through with that cinnamon whiskey, it, it even put me off. <laughs> even though it wasn't me. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe I will join. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, uh, Mazin with Bob. Ruth may join sure. us next week. She says that does sound hey. fun. So come on, see. come on, stream. We'll see Ruth. How you feel join next us Wednesday. with some whiskey. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's going to be a terrible episode. So we're going to have some fun with it. Um, yeah. And uh, thank you to uh, Chris, to the uh, uh, Tide Time Lord, to Stu Plum, to uh, Smiler Rainbow, uh, to The Beard, uh, to my co hosts, and anybody else that watching uh, after live. Uh, please let us know in comments what you thought about this episode in the comments below. And Join us next week at 8 o'clock UK yeah. time uh, for Sub Rosa. And, uh, and please subscribe. Whiskey. We've been sitting on 534 for like two months now. Just give us one more. Now we've gone wow. up six in the last uh, 24 days. We've gone up six. Oh, oh. Like, a, like a man in orthopedic shoes, I stand corrected. Yes. Yeah. 
It's grouchy. That should really be a bingo call. Eke it up. <laughs> the orthopedic shoes. That's going to be the next bingo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, all, it's covered in dad jokes, I think. <laughs> all right. Yeah. We'll see you then. The vault out.